Are you tired of the same old pro wrestling? Then check out the amazing action on Powerslam.tv, the biggest indie pro wrestling channel in the world. Get over 4,000 hours of the best pro wrestling events from over 110 of the biggest names in the industry from over 15 countries around the globe. Get your free trial today at powerslam.tv. The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. Hey, this is Scott Norton, and you're listening to Keeping It Strong Style. Yo, this is Rich Ladder from One Nation Radio. This is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We present to you the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Let's go. It's the Ace of Podcasts, Keeping It Strong Style. Covering New Japan, they ready to hold it down. Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh. Come and hit a job out in Barrio to Frost. From Tokyo Dome over to the G1. Social Suplex is a network where we can get it done. I'm a chiller. And let them have it Cause this is just an intro Keeping the strong style Six stars from the get go Boy Yeah from Tampa Bay To the Tokyo Dome This is Keeping It Strong Style With your host Jeremy Donovan And the young boy Joshua Smith And thank you for listening Welcome to Keeping It Strong Style The ace of podcasts On the Social Suplex Podcast Network Jeremy Dahman here With the young boy Josh Smith On today's show We are joined by Lord of Pain Radio's The Implications Matthew Mayer We'll be previewing Royal Quest The Young Lions Cup And answering all your questions Also covering all the latest news In the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling You can support our show By subscribing to the Social Suplex Podcast Network On the podcast app of your choice and leaving a rating and review You can also get all the podcasts and columns Over at socialsuplex.com This episode of Keeping a Strong Style Is brought to you by Power Slam TV Power Slam TV is an independent wrestling streaming service With over 5,000 hours of wrestling From companies all across the world Use the promo code Social Suplex To get your first month free of that service also, make sure you check out our Pro Wrestling Tea store, ProWrestlingTees.com slash Social Suplex. That's where you can get your official Keeping It Strong Styles t-shirt, as well as other t-shirts from here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. And like I mentioned in the, in, in the introduction, we are joined today by Lord of Pain Radio's Imp. How you doing, man? Nearly a slip of the tongue calling it an Imp. Introduction. I can't believe say it. <laughs> <laughs> An imp production for the, for imp. <laughs> uh, yes, it is hot, and as an Englishman, my hot bar is a lot lower than yours. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, yes, I am. Um, I'm happy to be on the show. Uh, yeah, excited to talk some New Japan, but compared to on my own show, where I can talk about whatever I want. <laughs> so. Yes, uh, imp's Lord of Pain and Adventure. That's the show, right? That's the title, right? Yes, I checked. The name used to be Perfect Ten Wrestling because I did it with someone else, and we were the only show because we went out on Thursdays. We decided to start incorporating NXT, so we thought, oh yeah, because Ty Dillinger was in NXT at the time, so we thought, yeah, let's call it Perfect Ten Wrestling. Who's and Ty then, Dillinger? <laughs> I mean, what's he really called now? Um, Gavin Sp- Spears. <laughs> Gavin Spears. I'm calling the ECW name. <laughs> the ECW name. Yeah. <laughs> the what was that the uh, the new talent initiative? That uh, they were doing. <laughs> what, what was his name when Shawn Michaels uh, super kicked him backstage? Like Stan, right? Yeah, he's oh, like, "What's oh, your yeah. name, Stan? <laughs> I kick <get> Stan. <laughs> you just made me super kick Stan." <laughs> yeah. So uh, Stan Spears wasn't on SmackDown yet, so it was an all right name, and and then he got promoted, and that was the end of that. Uh, yeah. I think, I think he <laughs> got demoted. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh. surely was not a promotion. <laughs> So like now, so I thought I branded my columns as imps, and then I put the promotion adventure. Yeah. So I thought I'd take that to NFP Radio, but now it's like a really long, convoluted name. <laughs> it's like imps NFP Radio Adventure. <laughs> like, oh. I've toyed with the tongue. <laughs> I've toyed with imp on LOP. <laughs> it's quite fun to say. Ooh, I kind of like imp on LOP. Imp on LOP. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a drug. Imp on LOP. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's so good to have you, Imp. You know, I've had the honor of being on your show twice now, and um, you know, you had the whole Imp and the Kiss Boys theme on the last episode. Yep. Listen, but now we have the young boy, so we can do the full-on <laughs> Imp and the Kiss Boys. I, yeah, 
I would have definitely been on that show, but I had prior engagements. And uh, in this case, usually I'm the one who drops the ball, but this time it was Jeremy. I, I did. That was, that, was, that was my bad. He did not tell me until the day before. He said, oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're recording tomorrow. I was like, what? <laughs> Got plans. Uh, yeah, I, I, I listened to that entire uh, introduction. You said your brother did it? Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> He's always been able to do voices, and we knew he could do that epic thing, like, epic. I can't do it. <laughs> just found out. Yeah, so we just spent like an afternoon doing loads of different versions, playing that music back and him going over the top of it. <laughs> so yeah, that was quite a but it's all the way to the end. I've got like it was like a nice little Easter with him doing loads of different variations of it. <laughs> so yeah. Man, I felt yeah, I felt really bad not being on the show and uh you guys recorded that special like introduction for us and I was like this man Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that, as soon as he said he wasn't going to be on, I was like, I'm still going with the Kiss Boys, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, running, I'm running the gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've made, I've, got, I've done a, uh, I've done a photo shot with the curtain and everything. I've been searching for cabaret themes. <laughs> I'm doing this. Uh, well, now searching for cabaret themes, by the way. <laughs> there are no royalty free cabaret themes. <laughs> Just really? for anyone else. <laughs> really. <laughs> it's kind of like back in the day, like when like promoters would book like. Steiners or like Legion of Doom, and then only Hawks there, and they're like, "We got the, we got one half of the Legion of Doom, but they like don't tell you ahead of time that it's not going to be both of them." <laughs> like, we got half, we're good. <laughs> oh, man. All right, and so like with all our guests, we like to ask them, you know, when slash how they started watching New Japan Pro Wrestling. So lay it on us, man. When slash how did you start watching New Japan? So in 2014. I had just finished university. Had a, so it, over in the UK, when we finish university, we we normally have a period of like half a year where none of us can get work, and if we do, it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the kind of that's the period I was in, and uh, like obviously feeling like a bit down afterwards. Like I had family trouble as well, so it was a bit of a weird period. And kind of, and and at the same time, WWE was starting their push of Roman Reigns. Mm. And it was like evidently, yeah, evidently. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I decided that summer to just check out something new. But as I know, when I was checking it out, was August is when the G1 climax happened. So I thought, yeah, why not? I'll try out this thing that I've heard about, but don't really know anything other than its name. And I ended up falling in love from that first. I say falling in love. It wasn't the main event that grabbed me. Because uh, I like when Roshi Tanahashi came out, I was like, "This is their top guy, the Air Guitar Man." <laughs> I found it really weird. <laughs> and that's the show that they had uh, Shinsuke Nakamura lose in the main event to Bad Luck Fale. So he didn't really feel like a top guy on my very first show watching. But like the overall presentation and like everyone else on the card and just that feel of you get an amazing feel for all of the characters throughout the tournament. Like that just grabbed me. And like, whenever anyone's asked me, like, how, how would you recommend getting into New Japan? Like, I always say, like, start with the G1 Climax, just because you'll learn all the factions, you'll learn all of the characters, and that's like one of the hardest bits to grasp about New Japan if you're just watching the big events like Wrestle Kingdom or Dominion. But you start with the G1 Climax, you learn all of the lore. <laughs> it's, it's draining. It's difficult, often quite difficult to keep up with, but you'll get like a massive grasp of the promotion by the time you finish. Yeah, it's a great way to um, you see pretty much all the top guys learn all their maneuvers, entrance songs. Yeah, I had uh, two natural implications. Implications. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, no, I had I had two natural inclinations to uh, to what you were saying there. Like when you were, you started like mentioning why Bad Luck Fale went over like uh, Nakamura, I wanted to like Melter explain for a minute. Well, you see him. The reason why Fale went over there <laughs> earlier in the year with the New Japan Cup. No, no I'm just playing. But um, the other thing too is uh. I've actually always said the opposite. I've always said like that people shouldn't start with the G1. It's too much. It's too daunting. Maybe start with Wrestle Kingdom, ease their way into it. But I'm starting to find out that I'm wrong and you're right because we've got friends who came in literally at the G1 and they loved it. And you you actually probably have a, a really good point there. I think for a lot of people, the G1 is their like launching pad into New Japan. And that's probably if, – if you can keep up with it, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and it's the thing that converted Doc into liking Tomohiro Ishii. Like, finally, we got oh him. My God. Yeah, <laughs> I, finally understand. yeah, I remember Rich and Doc is having conversations and Doc not getting Tomohiro Ishii. And Chad, Rich, Chad didn't like Ishii. He didn't get him. He didn't, under, he didn't understand fighting spirit. And, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, how do you not like Ishii? And, you know, me and Rich would talk about it and just be blown. And then finally, you know, G1 happened. You know, the, the dust was, you know, cleared out of the Doc's eyes. And he finally understood the magic of uh, Big Tom, uh, Tomohiro Ishii. So, Wow. He had his paw on the road to Damascus. Man. <laughs> the, 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 the wool was pulled from over his eyes, and he saw the glory that is Tomohiro Ishii. That's crazy. <laughs> also a uh, columnist dream, Tomohiro Ishii, because he's got so many different nicknames you can call him. <laughs> just like, oh, this, <laughs> he's Japanese, and he looks like a potato in a fridge. He's got no neck. It's like, oh, it's glorious. <laughs> So, and you did, like you started in 2014, but you know, listening to your show and different guest spots you've done and all the coverage, I mean, you you're pretty entrenched with like New Japan. I mean, did you at some point like do like a deep dive to go back into the archives? Because it seems like you know a, like quite a bit about this product, even beyond just you know recent history from the last five or six years. Uh, yeah, so it was when I got New Japan World. Which uh, to, it was back when it was still Japanese, so it hadn't had the English translation yet. So it was, it was relatively new. But I got I got it, and then I realised I've got all this archive, and I've not watched any of it. So like before, I'd been promoted to the main page of Laws of Pain. I decided to do this series where I'd pick one match, then dig deep into it as much as I can, and find out everything, like why the match was happening, like kind of the era, what best thing was like in that era, how successful it was. The state of the promotions, the uh, the character, like the people playing the characters, like what had got them to that point, and why were they doing it? What happened afterwards? So I did that with a couple of matches, uh, and I learned a lot by doing that. And then I kind of copied it, like the way I researched that. I copied it when I wrote my first like big piece on Lords of Pain for like uh, Carter and Naito going into there, looking to match. And then again for that, like, I did the story of Roshi Tanahashi, where I did exactly the same thing, where I found out as much as I can into every single year for that. But like the two matches I chose, they ended up teaching me quite a lot. Like uh, Chono versus oh, Beck. <laughs> hardcore guy FMW Anita. That's it. I forgot <laughs> Anita's name. <laughs> yeah, so Chono versus Anita from Wrestle Kingdom, uh, where it's like a an explosive barbed wire match, and it it it. It's one of them. <laughs> and the other one was oh, yeah. uh, Yuji Nagata versus Big Warrior Guy. I've forgotten his name temporarily. Oh, Power Warrior, whatever his actual name was. He wasn't Power Warrior at, at that point. Sasuke. But him, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so I, I did those two matches and went deep into the lore of why it was happening and what led them there and then what happened afterwards. And doing that really taught me a lot about New Japan and it kind of just rolled from there. Nice. And uh, like we mentioned, you know, you're a part of Lords of Pain dot net. Uh, so when did you start covering um, New Japan on LLP? It was, well, the first time I ever wrote a new, about New Japan was then. And uh, when I got from, so I did that in the columns forum where if you don't know, that's like Lords of Pain's NXT in a way. Uh, started by uh, Tito, of all people, came up with the idea. And it's kind of like his baby where... Laws of Pain would generate its own writers with a developmental system rather than trying to bring people in. And that's kind of where I came from, where I learned to write in there. I, I was crap when I started, but they kind of taught me how. And I thought I'd try this out in because you can do whatever you want down there. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, the... Yeah, uh, I, got, yeah, I oh, mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, the LLP forum is a great place. I've kind of had my few stints in there. <laughs> I was writing my uh, WWE G1 uh, fantasy um, series at one point that up anymore <laughs> in 20, never finished it. <laughs> 2017 which I failed to finish I mean trying to figure out who's gonna win the G1 that year <laughs> AJ or Seth <laughs> but yeah it's been a great place I, I dropped my Jay White column I wrote uh, this year on there so yeah the LP forum if you're a writer and you're trying to you know uh, hone your craft the LP forum is a great place to go in a lot of guys you know imp and a lot of guys doc are in there to kind of help you out give you some advice and you have the chance to be promoted and be on the main page LP has been around forever. I remember like literally watching a Nitro from like ninety seven, and someone's got like Lords of Pain, Lords of Pain dot net, like on the or is it dot com? Yeah, dot net, dot <laughs> net. Yeah, yeah. They they literally have like a, a lime green sign that like says Lords of Pain dot net, <laughs> and it's like nineteen ninety seven. I'm like, wow. 
Yeah, and you know, it was it actually, you know, our, you know, I think it's no, you know, surprise or any, you know, revelation. We have a, you know, social suplex and Lords of Pain have had a good relationship now for a quite a few years, and it was actually our relationship with LOP and the Doc that kind of uh, branched us into doing uh, Suplex Mania this past April in New York. So, you know, big love for all the LOP guys, and love the kind of thing we have going on here. Uh, yeah, uh, but um, so when I got promoted to the main page. Like, no one was writing about New Japan because, like, as we've talked about the history of LOP, it's primarily an American site and really they only talk about WWE. Like, some writers have tried other promotions, but it gets, like, no reaction. Yeah. So I decided when I got promoted, like, why not try writing about New Japan? It's getting a lot of steam. It was going into Naito Okada. Like, that is that was a big one. <laughs> so the <Yeah>. year <laughs> after Okada Omega as well. <laughs> so it's, like, it's not a bad time to give it a go. Uh, it's just like, like it's a known thing. Like, I got quite a few emails when I started, just saying thank you for writing about this, even though like my columns got like a quarter <laughs> of the replies. <laughs> but yeah, I like I get I get I like, I like all of my uh, kind of re- replies. I think commenters and everything. It's a, I've got a lovely crop because it's not really it's a smaller crop, but it's a lovely one <laughs> compared to other places where if you're like bashing WWE like uh, also, also there was a, a writer called uh, Triple R or just Rob and he gave me some really good advice of um, like be, like who you write how you write will bring in that kind of commenter that kind of reader uh, so I've taken that over to like the podcast world as well where like if you write or talk negatively you will attract that kind of person so I've always my my, my podcast has actually just been a lovely cup of tea in a chat so it's a nice relaxing kind of atmosphere and the thing with my columns where I try to be jokey if I'm critical I'll try and do it in a comedic way rather than just calling it crap Uh, that that, that attracts that kind of person and I don't really want that kind of commentary or that kind of atmosphere so uh, yeah I don't know why I bothered up (laughs) trust me I've had to learn the hard way I went in on mocks and uh People didn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, Imp, who's your uh, favorite New Japan Pro Wrestler right now? Well, right now, well, <laughs> it's, it's quite the, the adventure. I've got, like, a timeline. So <laughs> I, was my favorite. I prefer all time. Yeah, so, yeah, tell us your favorite of all time and then maybe your current favorite. Right. Oh, right. So, of all time, I'd probably go with Shibata. Mm. Mm. Purely because of uh, like when I started, he was rising. He'd already returned uh, like the year prior, and he was like rising up the field, proving himself. So that's when I saw him. Uh, like he just had his matches with Ishii, like the classics. Well, the first like, the year before, it was just leading into his classics at Wrestle Kingdom. So like I'm learning about Ishii as he's having his not Ishii, I'm as he's ma- having his amazing matches against Ishii, and his really strong tournament in the G1. And they're explaining it all as well, which is really useful for me. It's like he's got a lot of story going on just because he was like returning still and he was proving himself against Goto and Tanahashi and everyone. So it was like really interesting to watch around then. And mostly because like my immediate favorite when I first started watching was Homma. Like <laughs> he was over like hell. Dude, <laughs> Kokeshi, film, Kokeshi will make you happy. Bro, I, I, I've been trying to like explain to Jeremy how over he was back then. Like, and I'm, I'm like, bro, it was like a Daniel Bryan movement when it started. Yeah. Like it really was. Hama Mania was running wild. Hama Mania was a, was, yeah, it was. <laughs> it was a big deal. <laughs> it was like, um, the feeling was he was like the most over person that wasn't getting a push. Mm. Like he was getting like, incredible reactions for everything. And they're getting really behind him when he looked like he might actually win a match. Because, spoiler, he didn't do that well. (laughs) So, So I love it when he goes to the Kakeshi off the top rope, but it's so slow, and the guy's like, oh, no, he moved (laughs) again. Bro, that series of matches him and Ishii had, and that time when he finally beat Ishii in the G1, like, what a freaking moment. Like, yeah, I I love that series and that whole period of Hama's career. So, like, because that's when I was getting into New Japan, but I, ha- I hold Shibata in such a high esteem mm. just because he had those classics while I was getting in. And then, of course, there's the amazing match with uh, Ishii at Wrestle Kingdom and then the arguably even better one they had, like, a couple months later. Uh, so I, I, I envision him in really high regard. Uh, as of, like, the best currently, because, of course, he's not wrestling now, I, um, I want to say Okada... But the guy I pop for every single time is Yano. <laughs> <laughs> I love Yano. 
Oh uh, man, Toroyano um, causes a lot of um, chatter within our social suplex group chat. It's, there's, a, there's a fine line. You have your people who hate him and your people who love him. Man, there's no in between. Listen, yeah. All I know is that I'm never not entertained by Yano. Like, and yeah. I know everything he's gonna do. Well, not everything, but like you know, especially like during just regular tag matches, he's got his little stick. You know what it is. You know what he's doing. You've seen it a million times. But I'm somehow laughing every week, week in and week out. Like, I love the crap he does. Like, I, it just gets over with me. And he's also, like, a really good wrestler, believe it or not. So, yeah. Like, uh, Doc, Doc was asking for, like, any matches from last year's G1 to recommend. And I was immediately in there with Yano's two-run stint at the Koken Hall last year where he faced Zack Sabre Jr. and Koji Ibushi. Like, yes, please. <laughs> they were two of my favorite matches on the whole tournament. <laughs> they I were love, amazing. I love those matches. Also, big shout out to the Sonata match from last year. That one yeah. was amazing that as was well. Very good. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, was that the one with Rocky shouting? Yes, the one with Rocky. Yes, yeah, uh, he tied in the yeah. Paradise Lock on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think the oh. I think the Zack Saber match was Yano's best tournament match last year, and it was a really good match. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. Those guys have good chemistry. It's weird. Yeah, you wouldn't think it because like Xavier is so like technical and normally quite realistic in the sporty kind of way. But no, him and Nero, magic. <laughs> Absolutely love it. Absolutely. But yeah, so Yellow's number one in my heart. <laughs> I would have. <laughs> but uh, if I'm being like serious, kind of like who like who is the best? Uh, my personal like favorite is Okada because uh, I yeah again his rise to the top was when I started watching. So again, I hold him. He, he won that year's G1 climax. So that kind of puts him above for me because he was the first person I see saw like really succeed. What, what, so, I'm, what I'm gathering you from you, Imp, is that you've got two favorites in a time period. You've got the the real your real favorite, the guy that you think is the best, which is either Okada or Shibata, and then you've got the lovable underdog that that yeah. is in your heart, which is <laughs> Hanma. <and Yano>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for each era, I've got my uh, one that. Uh, Grab my heart, and then the one that is actually from, <laughs> like, actually big serious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yano is currently number one in my heart. Honda was, and then obviously we know what happened. Uh, yeah. So, but the, the, my favorite thing about that period is Honda used to do quite a lot of commentary. And, like, I don't know if you've ever heard him. I think my favorite description was it was like, uh, it was like, oh, I don't know what you call them. It was like gravel running down, like, the rain noise thing. It's, yeah. so cool. it's, it's terrible. Yeah, it's so bad. Yeah. I don't even. I don't yeah. even know how to like impersonate it. <laughs> it sounds. Like, <laughs> that's, that is what it sounds like. It sounds like a movie monster. Yeah, it sounds like a monster like tearing away at its prey. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like one of the one of the walkers from The Walking. Dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man! All right, Imp. So uh, tell us your your favorite New Japan match of all time. Only one. There can only be oh. Islander. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a bit. I was gonna cheat. I was gonna say Tomohiro Ishii versus Shibata because there's three of them. You can pick any of one of them, and they're mm. all amazing. Uh, I mean, if I had to pick one, I probably would go for their last one. As in the, I think of that new beginning or something like that. Uh, just it's a it's a culmination of everything that's happened so far, and they still go at each other like men, like at a mental pace. <laughs> it's a, they're just ten minutes of nonstop. Just like the two previously were. Uh, yeah, I'll probably go with that one, I think. It's here the doubt on my mind, because like, from this year, we've had Will Ospreay jump up, and he's just banging out classic after classic. And his Shingo versus Ospreay was like, for me, I've nothing's beaten that so far. Like, we've just had a, that that's G1 climax, and for me, I still hold Ospreay Shingo in such a high regard. Uh, but yeah, I'll go with Ishii Spatter. That's the one I... I watch their Wrestle Kingdom match like every year. I go back and watch it. Mm. So it's got it's got to be my favorite. If <laughs> that's the one I automatically jump to. Nice. All right, Mo. We're gonna talk about Royal Quest, which is happening this Saturday. And we can't talk about the Super J Cup because guess what? We haven't seen it. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people. I guess people don't really pay attention that much because a lot of people are like, Where, "Where's the Super J Cup? Why isn't it up on New Japan World?" I mean, we've said two weeks on the row in the news, like. Guys, it's it's on tape delay. It's not going to be up on New Japan World. Jeremy, they don't listen all the, to the entire show. They, they skip the news. They don't, they don't get to the <laughs> news. They get to the news and they're like, oh, end the podcast. You know. uh, but yeah, Super J Cup is up on delay. It'll be up in September. Um, we will not talk in, in about September. it. In September. We don't know when in September. Right. Just 
in, in September. Se- yes. So we won't talk about it here. No spoiler here. It's the spoiler free zone for those of you who are trying to dodge um, spoilers all throughout the internet. Good I, luck with that. I already got spoiled. I know. One. Yeah, I've been spoiled. I mean, just I mean, discovering the show and all the stuff I'm on, I, I got spoiled. But I do want to say this before we move on. I know we, we we try to keep it up tight. We try to keep it positive. But I want to say this. I understand the challenges. That New Japan has faced when it comes to distribution, especially when they're in a foreign country and it comes to like a big, uh, you know, card like this and an ambitious one at that because they've got three cards. But they really should have found some sort of way to distribute this on some level. And I mean, in my opinion, I'll keep it brief. The fact that they haven't been able to do that makes it even though it should be a big deal, not a big deal at all. Like it's going to be an afterthought. I question how many people other than real diehards are even going to see it, which is unfortunate because from every report I'm hearing, it sounds like the wrestling's incredible. Well, I think the one thing the, the Super J Cup has going for it is the amount of buzz it's getting. I mean, Melter, Melter has been all over Observer Radio um, this past weekend talking about it. All of the top sites have been talking about it. A lot of people who were there live have been giving rave reviews. So I think, you know, just the reviews from the Osprey Amazing Red match, I think people are going to make time to go back and watch this. But we all know how it is. Uh, the, the wrestling world waits for no man. And, you know, we've got a huge weekend coming up and then more after that. And stuff like this kind of gets lost in the shuffle if it's not available immediately you know right I mean? but uh so yeah so we're going to talk about royal quest happening this saturday it will be available on fight tv for purchase and then after a three-day delay it will be up for free or well, not for free your 9.99 yen on uh new japan world and we have imp with us to break down this royal quest card i mean imp are you going no i'm uh, not going <laughs> I will be live on Lords of Pain Radio immediately after All Out. So, nice. yeah, we, we yeah. will be too. Oh. We're going to counter program. <laughs> 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 All right. I'll be done within an hour. I'll be going live at like 5 a.m. my time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, so let's break this card down and uh, give our predictions for what we think is going to happen at Royal Quest. So the card is opening up with a six-man tag match. We have Risuke Taguchi, Shota Umino, and Ren Narita taking on Rocky Romero, Sho and Yo of Rapungi 3K. 3K, 3K, 3K. What do you feel on this one, Imp? Oh, well, it's Young Lions versus full-time wrestlers, so guess. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, the Chaos Boys are going to win this one, even if I'll be cheering for Shooter the entire time. I mean, like, after associating with Moxley, like, I'm assuming most people will be like, get in there, Shooter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's the, he's the man's se- man now. They have a secret weapon, though. They've got Taguchi, and he's the coach. So I'm not so um. certain we should... Uh... Discount this man just so quickly. I mean, yeah, yeah. Taguchi could pin a show or or, or, or <laughs> even Rocky Romero. Um, no, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he could. <laughs> That's true. Um, I think I'm easily in the camp for uh, Rapungi 3K, obviously. Yeah, I'm also right there with you guys as well. I believe Rapungi 3K will get this win match. It should be a great, um, entertaining opener right there. I think that'll be pretty good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So then yeah. we- also. Taguchi versus Romero, we're going to get some more of that sports entertainment. We got to do it. Plus, he can make rugby references, and we'll get it. Oh, there will actually be a reaction. <laughs> yeah, I expect some uh, great uh, UK chants and singing on this card. <laughs> Uh, so next up, we have the Golden Star Kota Bushi teaming up with Juice Robinson to take on the Bullet Club team of Yujiro Takahashi and Hikaleo. Young boy, I'll go throw to you first. Yeah, so this is an interesting matchup. Um, it's not one I'm necessarily looking forward to, to be honest with you. Um, the one thing that's on my mind is kind of tracking the progression of Hikaleo because he's been on excursion over in Rev Pro. Um, but I think the matchup is kind of a little... A little wonky, you know. I mean, one of these teams is not like the other. <laughs> right. You, you, you have the G1 Climax winner and the uh, former IWGP US champion on one side. And on the other side, you got the Tokyo Pimp and the Bullet Club Young Boy. Now, if P- if Peter's going to be there, then I'm definitely looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if she uh, c- catches a plane. Well, last time he got two rand. I think the commentators were saying he just went outside and grabbed two women. <laughs> so <laughs> they play up the fact that he's a player and he can convince any woman to do the role. 
<laughs> we might do that again. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was interesting last time. Hmm. I'm starting to I'm starting to grow conscious thinking about like a pimp character in 2019. <laughs> how negative <laughs> how negative that whole thing is. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to get into that. Yeah, but I like Peter. Uh, but yeah, I think that this match will be somewhat interesting. Um, I mean, why do you think that they have? I mean, is this just like a throwaway? Why do they have Ibushi and Juice going up against Bull Club members, or is it just just cause? Uh, you know, I think it's just cause they need to, to get Ibushi and Juice on the card somewhere. Um, they can't tease Ibushi and Okada because Okada's defending the title. All right. Um, yeah, so I guess that was the best spot for him. I guess. <laughs> well, I'm going with the good guys here. Bushi and Juice, Imp. Bushi and Juice, yeah. Yeah, also going to Bushi and Juice. I mean, I, I'd i be very uh, highly unlikely for the G1 Climax winner and the number one contender for the U.S. title to <laughs> take an L to, um, to the lower men on the Bullet Club side. You mean the former never openweight champion, you drove like <laughs> that, That's right, yeah. I forgot he was a former never champion. <laughs> From God knows how many years ago. <laughs> And then uh, next up, we have a non-title junior tag team match with Chaos's Will Ospreay and Robbie Eagles teaming up to take on the Bullet Club team, the current IWGP junior heavyweight tag team champions, the Bone Soldier, Taiji Ishimori, and the headbanger, El Fantasmo. Well, um, I got to let you guys know, I forgot that Ishimori and Fantasmo even had those belts. Like, I literally, until you just said it, I, like, when you were, like, the uh, non-title match, I was like, which one of these teams is the champion? I literally <laughs> forgot. <laughs> Imp, who you got? So, this is, I don't know if Rev Pro history is going to come into this. Mm. This is where my little British insider stuff comes in a bit. Elvin Tasmo and Will Ospreay have massive history in Rev Pro. And, like, early today I'll be watching their match from... Oh, Combo was called Epic Encounter. That was it from 2018, uh, from, from around this time last year. And uh, the kind of story was like Osprey was the kind of dickish heel champion in a way, as in like uh, he was the one trying to bring out uh, the, the attitude for male Phantasmo. So like if you look at it where it is today, like this match could not be any more opposite positions with Will Osprey as like the conquering hero of El Phantasmo, obviously. He's a Bullet Club's number one dick at the moment. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like complete role reversal uh, in the space of like one year. So yeah, those two have got, and those matches are highly acclaimed as well. They've had more than one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of history there in just in that, the fact they put on really, really good matches. And they've now got the history in New Japan, which has completely twisted everything. And El Fantasmo is hopefully not going to get his theme muted. That would be a irritate. <laughs> I, like, I love his new theme. Yeah, his new theme's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, that's why I'm confused on this one because I normally go with Osprey Eagles. However, if the Rev Pro history comes into it at all, a lot of their stories El Fantasmo rising up to Osprey. So if some of that's in there, I wouldn't count out Ishimori and Fantasmo. However, it's New Japan, so I might. Yeah, I'm torn. I mean, whenever, I, whenever I was about to side with Osprey and Eagles, I'm like, oh, but they might raise Fantasma with a cheeky win here. It's like, oh, this is the kind of crowd that might pop for it. Ooh. Yeah, this is it's a tough I'm, one. Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm going to go with Osprey and Eagles to get the win to set up a title match. I want a destruction shows the full card for destruction. All the destruction shows have not been put together yet. We got a few match announcements, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So I think, um, yeah, chaos gets the win here to set up a uh, title match. and one of the destruction shows. What do you think? Young boy, this is definitely a tough one. I mean, you've got a lot of intersecting storylines. Some of the things that imp uh, alluded to, obviously the history between all four of these guys dating back to, I mean, obviously there's, prior history but you know the, the more recent events uh with the best of the super juniors and the ongoings of the uh super j cups i mean this is a pretty loaded match um i think that you have a point there jeremy that they could be hypothetically trying to set up a uh, a junior tag title match but i don't think necessarily that eagles and osprey have to win to do that if they have a um something that's worth um if, they've, if they really have a real conflict that's 
um, worth like setting up a title match in the future that could happen. I'm actually going to go with Ishimori and Phantasma on this night. I see, mm. a, I see a lot of good guys winning, and I think they're going to need to balance it out to some degree. And so I think I'm going to go with the Ishimori Phantasma win. I think that they'll probably be Eagles here. Um, that's just my gut feeling. And then maybe because I think that they're. Need, there's probably going to be implications. I think the more important title in play is Osprey's junior t- title. Mm. And I think that they're looking to set something up on that side more so. The, the junior tags, those are those are afterthoughts. You can do whatever you want with those. What really needs to be set up is the junior title going forward. Good point. Imp, you decide who, who you're going with? Yeah, I've started with young boy. Yeah, it's... Uh. <laughs> uh, mostly, because this is, <laughs> mostly because this is like the one crowd where you could have El Ventasmo win and it wouldn't get crapped on at all. I know the Japanese crowds are really respectful, but this crowd might actually pop for it. So it's so because of that completely different dynamic, I think they could pull that off and it would go over really, really well. So, and of course it sets up more, we've already had Robbie Eagles, Will Ospreay. If, if they're doing it that way, we've had the Eagles versus Will Ospreay with their title match and in their respect. However, they don't really need to do that much to set up a, tag, a junior tag title match. That could be done pretty easily, especially if the baddies win in a baddie way. <laughs> so they need to set something up easily that way. Uh, but El Fantasma, he can be really raised here by beating Osprey, who's, who's obviously seeming like an undefeated king at the moment of the juniors. Yeah, so, so the the one yeah. thing the one thing that stops me from going Taiji Fantasma is Fantasma already uh, beat Osprey in best of the Super Juniors. So he already has a claim to a championship match, so he can always pull that out of the bag, and then getting and then um, with Eagles and Osprey winning here, you can you can do like a double title situation. One night you have Osprey defend against Fantasmo, and the next night you have Taiji and Fantasmo defend against Osprey and Eagles. Oh, that's a perfect December Copen Hall thing. Oh, <laughs> boy, <laughs> would do that. <laughs> So uh, next on the docket, we have Tetsuya Naito and Sonata taking on the Bullet Club team of Switchblade Jay White and the Crown Jewel Chase Owens. Young boy, who you got? Really? They've got Jay White and Chase Owens tagging again. Man, well, this this tag team was a revelation during the G1, and they're going to continue to be a revelation, and I see them beating Naito and Sonata. Mm. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> 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 Although I like Jay White and Chase Owens quite a bit. Um, this is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, this is very interesting. So obviously, you know, Naito was eliminated uh, mathematically during the B Block finals when he faced Jay White. Um, I'm a little surprised to see them turning around and going back to that. Mm-hmm. And also, the commentary team was playing up, um, you know, on commentary that Sonata had a win over um, Okada during the G1, and that uh, they, they they said on several occasions that they're like, Sonata's closer to getting a title shot than even Naito. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering if there's some sort of like um, importance to that when they're teaming Naito and Sonata uh, again, uh, together against Jay White. Like maybe there's going to be some sort of, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? like hostility between the two of them or something of that nature, you know, I, that's what the one thing I'm looking at, but I still obviously think Chase Owens is there to take a pinfall most likely. But um, yeah, I think the story here might be something between Sonata and Naito. I mean, what do you guys think? Yep. Um, yeah. I feel like, ugh, cause there, cause Naito has said he'd love for somebody to step up and take his position as the top of the LIJ, like someone to usurp him essentially. And, Sonata seems to be the guy like really going for that and proving it at the moment. Uh, there's been no like direct threat, but it's kind of like Naito starting to maybe underperform and the other LAJ guys are really stepping up. So like it's setting up next year really well. <laughs> it's slowly building up and them getting better, better than Naito. But Jay White and Naito, I feel like that's going to go somewhere. The, because it's trying to fit without doing a convoluted, weird tournament thing. The number one match that stands up for both of these guys at Wrestle Kingdom is Naito versus Jay White. Well, uh, well spoiler right. spoiler alert, they are, they're facing each other at Destruction in Kobe. Uh, oh, oh gotcha. right. Okay, so that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Also, uh, I might switch to Jay White, Chase Owens then. So mm. <laughs> give the heels a bit of momentum going into that. Um. You know, you mentioned that you think Sonata's going to be the guy to step up. If you asked uh, Rich Latta, he'd tell you Shingo already took the spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like if anyone's seen Shingo as a heel in Dragon Gate, 
Yes. Like, uh, he is an amazing heel. So yes. I'd be all up for him stepping up and, uh, the, oh, I can't say, I was going to say the phrase dicking on Nitro, but that doesn't mean anything to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm also going, well, you, you, you said you're going with Jay and Chase, Imp. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I'm going with uh, young boy here, Naito and Sonata. I think as much as we all love Chase, I think he's definitely taking the pinfall here, and I think Sonata will be the one to either pin or submit him. And giving, I think Naito needs the win. To be honest with you, like, like they made him look like such a fool at the end of that tournament. Like he needs it. I think he. Ha- I think we're gonna see a Destino. We could, yeah. yeah. I, and I do have a, a, an interesting opinion. On the future of Sonata, but it ties it, it ties into um, a question later on in the show. So I'll bring that back up later. Uh, so give any for conspiracy, John Donovan. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy's such a tease. <laughs> Uh, so next up, we have the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Champions, the Gorillas of Destiny, will be defending against the winners of the Rev Pro Road to Royal Quest Tournament. And Imp, I believe you have the rundown on the teams in this tournament and kind of some background on who you think could possibly win this tournament to challenge G.O.D. Correct. <laughs> so I've got uh, the entire rounds of this tournament and everything and dates and where they took place, if you give a crap about that. <laughs> so... Uh, so the first round, it's been going on throughout the whole of this month, this tournament, and the final hasn't happened yet, and I can't find out when it happens. <laughs> I'm going to search all over, it, and it, it seems it, it to happens, say... It happens at the Rev Pro show the uh, the day before. The uh, Summer Sizzler. Oh, uh, Summer uh, yeah. Sizzler. yeah, so that's what I've got noted <laughs> as August 30th when it takes place, but I didn't find any official thing, but obviously it is out there. It didn't look good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> so yeah, so the final is yet to take place. However, the uh, quarterfinals happened on August fourth as uh, my boy Gabriel Kidd and Sean Jackson defeated the team of Brendan White and Kenneth Halfpenny. Kenneth Halfpenny, br- brilliant British name. <laughs> That's a Halfpenny uh, That's not really these first matches aren't really much to write home about in the sense of the winners are probably pretty blatant. Like yeah, the Aussie Open defeating the Rascals who'd come over from America. To take part in the British tournament, of course the opponents are losing. <laughs> what are they like? Uh, uh, Damaloni and MK McKinnon. I don't know anything about MK McKinnon, but I know quite a bit about Damaloni from his time. He was in like the early NXT UK shows, and he's been growing up in like progress and the kind of promotions of that ilk. So it's good to see him kind of making it to that kind of next step because he's one of those young, impressive guys. There's quite a lot of those in the UK, and he's one of those who is like really developing really well. Uh, then the Rev Pro Tag Team Champions are Josh Bodum and Shaw Samuels. If you know anything about Shaw Samuels, it's like, Courtney Giza, ah, oh, what prick. <laughs> I don't know what that voice was. <laughs> but that's essentially Shaw Samuels, like a bit of a prick. Josh Bodum, also a bit of a prick, but also got really good kicks. So he's essentially the English Kyle O'Reilly, <laughs> I guess in that sense. Nice, you can't Where, go wrong with that kind of comparison. <laughs> Uh, he's not. Uh, he's probably not the best actually because he's nowhere near the same technical thing. But his kicks are like right up there, and he uh, he does quite a few roundhouse kicks as well, just to show off because he's fancy. But yeah, so he and Charles Samuels are the tag champions, and they're the big heels going into this. Uh, I don't know who would be best against Grilla. I think we get the finals. Anyway, so after that, Josh Bodum and Charles Samuels won the semi-final match in Southampton on August 11th by defeating Gabriel Kidd and Sean Jackson. Gave your kid from Nottingham, just like me, and he he did he did well. I think it was, it was around this. I can't remember when it was. That this year, gave your kid. Uh, he Shabatas sort of welcomed him to the LA Dojo or said we'd take you on or something like that, like in front of everybody, which is like an awesome moment. And of course, him being from the same place as me, he's like you go get him, kid. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> awesome. Uh, and uh, in the second match of the Open, Carl Fletcher and Mark Davis they defeated Dan Maloney and McKinnon. Uh, of the Open are getting. They're one of those really popular teams that are getting lot like booked everywhere. And whenever they go, they get booked really strongly. It's just really over team. However, I'm somebody who really struggled to kind of connect to them a little bit. I don't know why it is. I've just, I've just not been drawn to them the same way lots of people have. And I've probably put them as my favorite to win the whole tournament. So the final takes place, as we're saying, uh, on the day before Royal Quest. Uh, of uh, Josh Bodum and Sarah Samuels, who are the British Tag Team Champions against Aussie Open. 
But Aussie Open are like the massive fan favourites and it wouldn't surprise me if Repro used this to set up Aussie Open versus the Tag Champs down the line because I can have them beat them because the titles are on the line. Perfect sense. But yeah, Aussie Open are super over, like everywhere. Just, just not in my house. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> but yeah. I fully expect them to win. Like the up-and-coming baby faces. Uh, they're, they're younger than they look as well. Uh, maybe that's an Australian thing. I don't know, but... <laughs> yeah, fully expect all the to win and face good as a destiny at Red Pro because they're the popular team. And it'd be weird to have the heel team win to face good as a destiny. That's a bit of an odd matchup. Yeah, that would be an odd matchup. I like um, Aussie Open. I've had the chance to see them wrestle a couple of times live now, and they're always been uh, great. And I think having a fresh uh, babyface team like them against GOD would be probably the best call. Yeah, I um the first time I ever saw Aussie Open, I was like, I don't really get this. These guys kind of seem swaggerless to me. There's not much to them. That was about two years ago. And <laughs> since that time, I've done a complete 180 on them. Like, I love Dunkzilla. I love Kyle Fletcher. Like, I love these guys. I think they're one of the best tag teams out there on the independent scene and internationally, honestly. And I've seen them have some bangers uh the the series of matches they had with the swords of essex this past year oh my gosh like some of the best tag team wrestling in the world that nobody is talking about um so i i've been wanting to hopefully see these guys uh at some point get signed somewhere they they, to me they're like one of the last really popular tag teams that are unsigned and um i would love to see them like you know dip their foot in the water and come to new japan on some level um, I think that would make a lot of sense. I don't know if, you know, they can afford them or not because they're probably a pretty hot commodity out there, on, you know, on the free market. But, yeah, that's who I want to win, and I would like to see them, uh, you know, challenge G.O.D. for sure. So, so. Well, because of all their time in, uh, like, progress wrestling especially, I just assumed they were going to get WWE'd. But, no, they haven't been. So it is wide open for anything to happen. Yeah, they're, they're, I get, get are they, are they done with progress now? They've not been on in a while, yeah. but uh, progress, of, they're, they're in a turning point themselves. And the kind of the UK scene is as well, because of uh, WWE's kind of like new contracts, it's having ripple effects. I heard that saved the scene out there. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what, that's what people were saying. That's, that's what Pete Dunn said. <laughs> <laughs> it would have saved the scene if Brexit wasn't happening. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, prices for everything are skyrocketing. So there's like people just aren't going to as many shows. Like the entertainment business as a whole is taking a hit. It's not just a wrestling thing. So it, I guess, a good example is like uh, in Japan when like the '90s was incredible, and then suddenly people just didn't have the money to constantly go to all these incredible shows. So the the kind of demand went down. That's kind of happening here. Mm. So they could still, they're still going to wrestling shows, but like they need to like Red Pro, they're bringing in like massive names to sell out these tickets. Uh, so that's the kind of way it's going. But it's one of those where it's not dying. It's just that people are having to be a bit more selective now. Which when because it's so uncertain the whole basic thing. If there is a bit of certainty down the road, it will change. It's just like now prices for everything are going up. So you know that, that's great. That, that's love. That's, <laughs> Talk about New Japan again. <laughs> uh, so it seems like we're all on the same page with wanting Aussie Open to win and challenge GOD. Do we think that there's any chance that Aussie Open could beat GOD and become the new IWGP Tag Champions? I would, that, I would love it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm down for it. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. I, <laughs> I'm going to stick with the safe bet and say GOD retains, but. Um, yeah, I would really like that. I think that would be a really interesting thing to do going into the second half of the year, especially with uh, the World Tag League, which we're going to have to watch <laughs> uh, in the back half of the year. So, yeah, um, I would love to see a title change, but uh, only if it's Aussie Open. The rest of the teams, I don't really know them as well, so I'm not here for that yet necessarily, unless like there's some team out there, like unless like Josh Bodum and Shaw Samuels like fucking rock or something. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know what? I'm I'm gonna be you know the, w- the wild card of the hipster. I'm gonna go with Aussie Open beating God to become the new tag team champions, freshen some things up. I would uh, love it, and you know change up that kind of stale tag team scene. What, mm. you, what are you thinking? Um, yeah, I, I feel like I've got to go for the boring one just because I can't 
see them shaking it up like this way. It'll be it'll be an awesome pop. Like the the crowd will go mental for it. I just don't see it happening. Like maybe they get screwed over in some way. And like their reward is the tag team championship match against Shaw Samuels and Bodum. Like it's yeah, maybe not here or now. Like they does need revamping, and they do need to bring in new teams. Uh, especially as like they were kind of doing that, and then all of them left for WWE. So it's like ah. Oh, Shit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now it's like even Kushida and Alex Shelley bloody rejoining again and it uh, evolved. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> like even like- this weekend it evolved. Uh, I believe it was about 134. Alex Shelley surprised Kushida. <laughs> so it's like even the popular teams from the recent past are going <laughs> in a really <laughs> weird way. Uh, but, but yeah, I see GOD retaining here. Uh, yeah, it's one of those where the tag team scene in New Japan is one of those things that's fallen a bit by the wayside, like be it the juniors or the actual main singles ones. Uh, but when you get close to the Wrestle Kingdom, you do get like the massive highlight that's the World Tag League. Uh, even if I don't particularly watch it, that's the one time a year I kind of tune out from New Japan. Like, I take my break <laughs> kind of on them. Yeah, like, yeah. just after G1, where you're, where you're all like New Japan out and you just need like a month off <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, I, I do the same just before Wrestle Kingdom. I think most uh, New Japan fans kind of take the month of December off and don't pay too much attention to World Tag League. But here at uh, Keeping a Strong Style, since we are the ace of New Japan podcast, we give our listeners in-depth coverage week to week of the epic <laughs> World Tag League tournament. I was about to ask you, I was about to be like, yo, are you, are you trying to do that? Because I'm down. Like. <laughs> oh, man. But I'm on on Thursdays on LP Radio, so by that time I'm going to have AEW the night before. So mm. oh, I'm with like Dreamland of things to talk about. Maybe NXT as well, depending on how that works over here in the UK. Because the American way, I wouldn't get it. But I think it's different outside of America because we don't obviously we don't get it on USA. I don't even know if we get it on TV at all. So I think our deal is we get NXT live on the network as if it's normal. Gotcha. Which is. Yeah, that's great for us. That means I can actually cover it. If it switches to the American model, then I can kiss covering it goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Take my money, AW. You're on free television. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next up on the Royal Quest card, we have the Never Openweight Championship match as the Never Openweight Champion. Tomohiro Ishii will defend the belt against Bullet Club's newest member, Kenta. Yeah, this uh, these top three matches on this card are right up there in line with almost any card the entire year, which is pretty uh, pretty amazing. Um, I gotta tell you, this is my most anticipated match of the night by far, by far. Same here. Yeah, out of all the matches, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to Ishii and Kento the most. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree. Well, Ishii uh, last year, so on that same show that I was watching uh, with uh, Osprey and Phantasmo, uh, it's the one with the main event of Ishii versus, uh, what was his bloody name? Keith Lee, that's it. The two big lads <laughs> having an amazing ball. Uh, like, Ishii is really highly respected in Red Pro. Like, obviously, he was the British heavyweight champion last year. So he, he brings it when he comes to Red Pro. And yeah. he's against Buddy Kenta. I was <laughs> 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 so high for this. I'm, I'm going to just say it real simply. I'm not going to even have to give you in depth anything. Kenta's taking this belt. Kenta's coming overseas. He's going to freaking GTS uh, Ishii, and he's taking that never belt. And it's like emphatic. Like this is the end of of Ishii's reign for sure. Yeah, you know uh, our good pal Rich Ladder likes to call Kenta a whole ho. <laughs> But I, I think that Kenta is going to take his whole knee and put it through Ishii's head. Oh, my god! And become the new Never Openweight champion. <laughs> Turn that boy into a baked potato. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> yeah, I think this uh. match is going to be incredible. I think it's going to be super violent. Um, I think that the British crowd is going to eat this up all day. Um, oh. You know, and what, do you, what are you thinking about this match? Pretty much everything you said, like, Red Pro is one of those crowds that seemingly they eat up every Ishii standard thing they does in this match. Like, he doesn't even have to go incredible Ishii. We will go mental for it <laughs> if he just do the standard Ishii stuff. But then he was try hard, and he's against Kenta. And I reckon they are going to try, like, they're going to go a little bit above normal because I do really feel they're going to change the championship, especially after Kenta's amazing heel turn. 
Um, the, the only worry is heel interference, kind of murking what I feel like would be an amazing match. However, they don't really, in New Japan, if it deserves the amazing match, they will normally give it the, the amazing match. Uh, even if there is interference, like you'll still get, like we saw in the G1 Climax final, like there still was interference, but that didn't really detract from the match. In fact, it like really enhanced it and added to it. I'm expecting something kind of similar here where Ishii fighting up against the odds, only difference being that Kenta's kicks are too devastating for him and he eventually doesn't kick out after, of course, kicking out at one, at least to three of the kicks. <laughs> something like that. Yeah, he'll kick out at one after like a psycho knee or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm sure like uh, Master Heater, Jado, or either maybe even Gato will be out with Kenta or, or maybe some other Bullet Club guy will be out with Kenta to try and... Um, cause confusion, cause uh, distractions, and help Kenta get the win over Ishii. So that takes us to our next match. We have the undisputed Rev Pro British Heavyweight Championship match as the current champion, Zack Sabre Jr., defends against the ace, Hiroshi Tanahashi. What are you thinking, Imp? So... I want to say Zack Sabre Jr. because he kind of needs it and he's having quite a strong championship run. However, I can also see the reaction of the British people going, holy shit, Tony Hashi's our champion. That means we're going to see him again. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, it's a twist between the two of them. But I may say because Zack Sabre Jr. is having such an amazing year and maybe because Tanahashi did beat him at Madison Square Garden that we can enforce a bit of 50-50 booking here. He but did, what happened he in the He didn't beat him at G1. Madison Square Garden. Oh, right. who won it? Oh, but did, oh, did SJ won at Madison Square Garden? Yes, ah. yeah, Saber won in the oh. Garden, and then Tanahashi beat him like two times after that. Oh, okay. Oh, so we've already had a 50 50 booking. <laughs> so this one's like nice and open. Um, but yeah, I think Zach Saber Jr. is having such a strong run. It'd be really weird to change hands, even if like the only reason you would change the title really is for that, oh my God, Tanahashi's our champion kind of reaction. It's not probably not worth it. And Zach Sabre Jr. is having a great run. I expect him to take it all the way to Wrestle Kingdom and defend it there as well as like a great representative of uh, RPW. It's, uh, it's oh, I'm still expecting something where he gets a little bit elevated. That makes sense because he had that amazing New Japan Cup run. And then this year he's he's struggled with Boris Johnson and Brexit. <laughs> and it's <laughs> like his life falling apart. I would I love I would love for the like the fact of his character might either succeed next year or crumble depending on how Johnson's prime minister run goes. <laughs> <laughs> like just him just saying to Gator, it's like, oh no, just wait and see how it goes, because if it all goes to crap, it would make no sense for me to have a good year. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that about the G one. <laughs> That's the literal reason he didn't do well because he was worrying about <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I'm going with ZSJ to win this one. Yeah, I want to agree with you, Imp. I think uh, Sabre is going to take it here. Um, I totally agree with you. Him uh, being the Red Pro Champion, going into Wrestle Kingdom, having a big defense on one of those two Dome Knights. And, yeah, I, I just don't know how often Tanahashi could be going back over to the UK. So, uh, yeah, I'm going Sabre. And I guess that just leaves me. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a matchup that I really have enjoyed over the past few years. I mean, there's a lot of history between uh, Zack Sabre and Hiroshi Tanahashi. Um, some of the things that Imp alluded to when it comes to Zack's current reign, and then, you know, even from a historical standpoint, I'm not, I'm not the biggest Rev Pro mark in the world, but, um, I mean, Zack Sabre had a really, really long, I think over a year-long reign previous to this. Now he's enjoying another very lengthy reign. I think when everything's said and done, they're going to kind of see him as like that company's most prolific champion, you know, just based on the amount of defenses he's had, the amount of, you know, business that he's, you know, drawn to them and, you know, the length of his title reigns for sure. Um, Tanahashi winning the belt makes a lot of sense to me, but Tanahashi's health and Tanahashi's age and things like that really cause me to question whether or not they could actually go that way but if you here's what i will say i'm gonna go with zach saber because it makes sense but if you were ever going to switch the title this is the show you do it on and this is the this is the guy you do it with yeah that makes a lot of sense but i don't think they will but um i don't want to completely rule it out because i'm not that 
heavy on Zack Saber when it comes to this particular matchup. I'm like 51% Zack and 49% Tanahashi. Like, I think it's actually really close, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty close also, but I don't know. Something in my gut's telling me to go with Zack. I, I agree. The only thing is, is like with Tanahashi, he doesn't have to have a really long run. I think it's important to that company to have prolific guys in the lineage of their title, it elevates that title and who else could could raise the title more than Tanahashi? Plus, right. you can do a return match between him and Zach. And Zach can get it back. Yeah, you could. Yeah, I mean, at any point. Um, or you, you could elevate a new UK guy by getting it off. Beating the, Tanahashi. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there there are reasons to put it on Tanahashi that make a lot of sense to me. One reason I'm against it necessarily is because if Ishii's dropping the belt to Kenta. Are we about to see two title changes back to back in big profile matches? I mean, I don't know. I don't know about that. But uh, yeah, I'm gonna go with Zach. But I wouldn't be surprised if Tanahashi hits him with a high five flow and or or you know cradles him or something. Yeah. So that brings us to our main event of the evening for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. The champion, the Rainmaker, Kazuchika Okada, defends against the leader of Suzuki Gun, Minoru Suzuki. We know these guys have had a pretty long history. I believe the last time these two wrestled was at that Suzuki anniversary show last year when they had the the match out in the outside during the rain. Suzuki was wearing his uh, throwback white gear. That was a 30-minute draw, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the match in the rain? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a great match. And Okada and Suzuki always have great matches. So I'm looking forward to these guys going one-on-one one more time. Young boy, who do you who are you going with here? Well, uh, I think it's pretty open and shut case. It's got to be Okada. Um, although I got to tell you, man, I would love for uh, Minoru Suzuki to get one title reign with the IWGP title. I mean, he's one of the most prolific wrestlers, and you know, the in the last. 30 years in, in Japan and he's held every single major title in every major company except for this one. And it's the one belt that's kind of eluded him. And the fact that he came up as a dojo boy and he was, I know apprentice and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, as you would have thought at some point that Suzuki would have gotten uh, a run with this belt, but the stars never really aligned for him. And at this point he doesn't necessarily need it, but I would love to see that at least just once you know, but um, this match is going to be really, really good. Okada and Suzuki always deliver magic. They always have great matches. This one, especially in this environment, bro, they love Okada over there. They love Suzuki over yeah, there. Yeah, Suzuki, a former Rev Pro champion as well. Yep, this is a this is a. Bit. Was he Rev Pro champion? Did him and yeah, Ishii? Ishi? Yeah. Well, he was a tag champ. Was did he ever hold the the main belt? Didn't he take it from Ishii and Ishii took it yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, he did. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember, but um, I think that this is the like a really fitting match. Um, and props to you, Jeremy, because you're you're one of the few people that were like, I th- I see this for this card, and I, I wasn't so sure about that, but you were absolutely right. And um, I think this match is going to be fantastic. Uh, I think we're gonna there's gonna I think there's gonna be a lot of moments. Where it looks like Suzuki is going to be Okada. <laughs> yeah. And I'll probably bite. But at the end of the day, I think Okada's hitting him with the Rainmaker, the one, two, three, and he's going to continue on to his path to the dome. Yep. Yeah, I'm pretty much exactly what Young Boy said. I think, I would say, during that, there's absolutely a massive moth to show up against my window. <laughs> like, let me in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a bit heart beating. <laughs> it's totally fine. Uh, yeah, over uh, easily Okada is going to be. Being Suzuki here, it, it's not outside of New Japan law to have somebody like have a thank you reign. I'm not sure if they've ever done it like after the G1 climax on that road to Wrestle Kingdom, though. And I think the last time they did it, it was uh, like Manabu Nakanishi. So I'm talking quite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't really see it uh, happening here. Uh, I know Suzuki is yeah definitely a former British heavyweight champion. He's regarded quite highly in Ref Pro. Whenever he comes to Ref Pro, he normally main events. Like he's held in such a high regard there, and I yeah I can't see Okada losing though. They're going to build him up all the way to Wrestle Kingdom, and Suzuki is just somebody that he always has amazing matches with. So it's and they've been highly um, kind of bringing up the match in the rain in the build for this one. So they're kind of building it up to. Do you remember that match in the rain? Yeah. <laughs> now they're going to do it again. <laughs> it's like oh okay. 
So that is what I'm, I'm expecting a really good match here just because they built it up that way instead of bringing up the like previous matches in Rev Pro. Like, I think they've had like tag matches before, something like that. So yeah, I'm expecting big things from this match, even if it is a bit predictable, but Okada is the king of like in that final sequence of his matches, even though you're going in going, oh, this is predictable as hell. He still gets you. Like he makes you forget all of that in the final sequences. And that's kind of what I love about Okada. He's one of those guys where he sells for his opponent as much as they sell for him when he makes them look like a million bucks. And when it enters that, like that final stage, like, Oh God, they might actually win here. Even if you're like, wait, no, of course they're not. No, it's Okada. Of course he's winning. <laughs> so yeah, I suppose it'd be an amazing main event. Yeah, and I'm going with both of you guys. I'm thinking Okada's going to win. This is going to be a fantastic main event, like you guys both mentioned. Um, you know, Okada's so great at selling, and he's going to suck us into the story of this match. I'm, I'm sure Suzuki is going to target one of his limbs and do a lot of submission, a lot of striking, and Okada's going to sell that really well and get you sucked in and make you think that Suzuki actually has a chance of winning. Um, and then towards the end, he'll have that awesome closing streak, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of great counters. Uh, ending with Okada hitting a big rainmaker on the King Suzuki and getting a, a win. This will be a solid uh, match, solid uh, tile defense on the road to the dome, and it'll be a great way to close off this Royal Quest show. And uh, we do have this, a- this will be, in my opinion, a real man's match. This is going to mm. be the this will, in or my a real man Hall of Fame, real man Hall of Fame match. The Rich Ladder Special. Yeah, it's going to be, uh, in my opinion, the hardest hitting match that um, Okada's had since the Shibata match, and mm. he's had quite a few hard hitting matches. But I think on this night with this crowd in this moment, they're going to make it special. Like this is going to be this is going to be a good one. And we do have three questions here. First question comes from Ricky from the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show right here on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. The second best looking man on <laughs> Social Suplex. <laughs> uh, so Ricky asks, will this be the best show of the three running that day? And he's referring to the three big shows. So we have Royal Quests, we have NXT TakeOver UK Cardiff, and then we have All Out. There is a very good possibility it could be. Um, I think that the crowd over there in uh, this is what in Wales? No, that's that's the takeovers in Wales. I keep getting them. This is in the copper box. Copper box, yeah. Uh, I think this copper box crowd is getting one of the best uh, New Japan offerings of the year, but I still see it like just it's like. It's not at that tippy tippy top level. It's kind of closer to like an anniversary show, or uh, maybe a, maybe a step above that. Maybe closer to like a new beginning um, type level show. I mean, it looks really really good, but there's still some pedestrian matches as well. Um, I think the atmosphere and the crowd is really going to elevate it, and that might be the thing that puts it over the top. But I mean, I don't know. That double or nothing show looks really. I mean, it does look really good in a lot of in a lot of ways, especially with some of the shuffles that have taken place. So I don't know if it is going to be the best, but it it could. What do you think, Imp? Well, I think like with um, with just like with All In last year, like the actual quality of the individual matches was like nothing. Oh my god, five star bait the scale kind of amazing. But like the atmosphere and the it was, they were the perfect matches for that crowd as well, like to get the perfect pop. I feel like this crowd for All Out is going to be exactly the same uh, where the actual quality of the matches don't really mean as much compared to like NXT UK where their matches will be criticised to the point and they will have to be good uh, Royal Quest well, maybe not as much because if they if they deliver New Japan to the English audience we will eat it up and it'll be fine <laughs> so I think NXT UK is in the most danger because that will get the most criticism All Out will get criticism but the actual but I, I would count myself as somebody who's just excited for it and isn't really being very critical of it at the moment. So like, just like I'm with New Japan, where I'm just I'm just interested in it, I'm enjoying it, I'm not being critical of it like I would be WWE. So I might go with AEW just because it's that final show before October, so the crowd is going to be amped up as hell. Whilst in the whilst we're getting people excited to see New Japan, I think I think the UK one might be the least just because the, it's the one show where the crowd won't elevate it to a incredible point. They'll still elevate it, but they'll be in Cardiff, so they've got, they've got anybody who... If anyone knows anything about Wales, they're really good at singing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you hear that. The uh, I don't know why they ran it today, 
on that day. So it's insane. They've got Wales playing a match in the rugby and Wales are like the number one team right now in rugby. So it's difficult getting any hotel space to actually be anywhere. The prices are going to be really jacked up and it, the, the town's going to be full for the for that. Never mind doing the show in there as well. Mental WWE, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so yeah, it'll, yeah, the crowd will be up for it, but I reckon the New Japan and AEW crowd will be just that bit better. Uh, will it be the best? That that all out card for me that one's uh, way too strong. Uh, and yes, I am a AEW mark at the moment. <laughs> I'm just eating up everything they do. Yeah, I mean I, I'm an AEW mark too. You know, Young Boy and I were at All In last year, and like you mentioned, yeah, just being there live, that atmosphere was crazy, and just the momentum they've built since then has been phenomenal, and they've done a great job of creating this. Um, you know, raving fan base who eats up everything they do. And once again, I think they've done a great job laying out the all out card. And like young boy mentioned that, um, you know, that recent additions to the card, I think it's going to overall on paper. I think um, all out has the potential to be the best card, Um, you know, and not to um, forget about, you know, the UK takeover. I think that card is um, a lot of people are sleeping on that card. I think there are a potential for that card and up being a pretty great show. There's a lot of great matches on that card at that uh, Tyler Bate Walter main event should deliver. Those guys always have great matches together and they've done a great job on NXT UK kind of building that rivalry up with uh Mush Dash Mountain, uh, British Strong Style and um, Imperium. So I think that main event can deliver. But you know, these last three matches right here on Royal Quest are have the potential to be, you know, four stars and above all three of them. So, um, and you got Osprey on the card too, and he is always balls to the wall, even in undercard matches. So, um, Royal Quest also has the potential to end up being one of the best cards. But for me, if I was putting money on it, I would, I would say AEW all out would, is going to end up being the best show from bell to bell perspective. Uh, oh, and my uh, my normal co-host for my like aftershock show, for which I do for AEW, uh, Jan Man, he's going to be at All Out, so I'll be by myself at five AM <laughs> talking <laughs> about the show. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> but yeah, but shout out to Jan Man, who's uh, I'm very jealous he's going to be there live. He was there last year as well, and uh, he did an amazing kind of emotional speech like after he got back. So it's that I think that'll still be up on the archive. For LOP, but yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And our, fun, John, our AEW team, uh, Floyd Johnson, Amy O, and Tiffany will be out there as well. So I'm kind of jealous of those guys too. Uh, we'll be back here um, at the uh, dojo having a watch party and uh, checking it out here. But I think I'm inviting my dad. Nice. <laughs> I think, yeah, like I was thinking about it today, I was like, he should, we're having a party. He should probably come over and watch this. Like, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to invite my dad over to watch <laughs> AEW. Nice. He's uh, going to be like, who are these guys? <laughs> <laughs> um, we got a question from a friend of the show, Dan Coffin. He says, what up, Dan? He says, which title do you think is most likely to change hands, if any? Uh, I think we're all in agreement that the never title will be the title that's most likely to change hands, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that that is easily the like the most likely of all the belts to switch uh it's not a belt pal <laughs> a, belt, a belt holds your pants up damn it <laughs> it's not a strap <laughs> uh, but i think that that's the most likely championship to change hands after that i think that i'm more on board with the rev pro title switching than even the iwgb tag titles that's kind of the i would that's the rating i would go i'd go never then rev pro and then IWGP tag, and then the IWGP title. Yeah, I agree with that order. Yeah, with the word what young boy said. And then we've got a question here from Muzza. Uh, three questions, actually. So first he says, Imp, are you going to Royal Quest? If so, we need to meet up. Uh, but you're not going, right? I am, I am not going. I'll be watching live at home as Tyler Bate defeats Walter. But then after that, I'll be watching All Out Live to then be <laughs> live on. But then after that, I'll be watching Royal Quest whenever it goes up on New Japan World like a month later. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, he says, which match are you most excited for? Well, on this card, I think I've already answered it. Ishii versus Kenta. Yeah, I think mm. I think for all of us, yeah. we're all excited. I think that's our most anticipated match. Are we going to be disappointed by a Kenta match again? 
I don't think we are. I don't think so. It's it's, it's Tomo or Ishii. Hey, let me tell you this: if if he gets in there with if Kenta gets in there with uh, Ishii and doesn't have a banger, I mean, it doesn't have to be a five star match. But if it's not really like a banger, then we're gonna have to have then it's time to start a dialogue. It's time to start a dialogue. Um. <laughs> 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 uh, Let's see his next question. Because I'm pretty sure we can have a like. I'm pretty sure with no training, I can have a four star match with Ishii right now. <laughs> like I'm just gonna put it out there. Um, his next question: How would you rate the overall Royal Quest card? Um, well, I think uh, Young Boy's kind of already done this, equating it to like a new beginning type of quality type of thing with a few matches, which probably are just fleshing out the card a bit. So yeah, it's a good card. I don't think it's actually as like from from start to finish, it's as strong as the other two shows that are on the same day. But that's more because like they've been building up to it for months. Those kind of shows compared to this one, which is like one of the many for New Japan. But yeah, on the same like level as New Beginning and those kind of like ones in between the big events, it's a really really good show like that. Yeah, I agree. If you overall, it's a really good show. Definitely, I think, yeah, a new beginning level. I mean... Dontaku. Dontaku, yeah. I mean, these I mean, those, those used to be big shows, and they're not anymore. These last three matches, I mean, any of these three title matches could main event, like, a Destruction or mm. some other show throughout the, the year. These are three big matches that are all happening on one card. A Hino Kuni. Oh, yeah, Hino Kuni. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is some good stuff here. So, overall, I think it's a really great card, um, you know... I would say go out of your way and uh, drop the money on Fight TV like we're going to do and, and watch it live and don't let it get caught in the, um, you know, in the shuffle. But uh, I understand if people want to wait to go on New Japan World, but this is a pretty good card. All right, so uh, now... I'm going to throw it up on Periscope for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so now we're going to talk about the Young Lions, and this worked out perfectly because we have a lot of questions. You, you, you forgot part of Maza's final statement. Oh, yeah, I missed that. My bad. Yeah, Maza's last question. He said, damn it, why is Yano not there on the Royal Quest card? Because he sucks. Because Gato hates him. Because <laughs> he sucks and Gato hates him. <laughs> Gato, and, and, Gato's burying him. And he got signed to NXT. <laughs> <laughs> Counter program. <laughs> Oh, oh like cause there's, there's a talk of them doing a NXT Japan. And like if he's like the first name, <laughs> yeah, no, go NXT Japan. <laughs> oh my gosh, Yano, your first NXT Japan champion. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so now we're going to talk about Young Lions. We did have a couple questions about Young Lions, and it came just at the perfect time because uh, news about the Young Lions Cup broke. Uh, was that this morning? This morning, yeah. Oh my gosh. So we've been talking about it. We're like, when are they going to do one of these? When are they going to do one of these? I freaking love the Young Lions Cup. The Young, the Young Lions Cup is my favorite tournament in New Japan. Yeah, the Young Lions tur- uh, Cup is great. When we first started the show in November of 2017, the 2017 Young Lions Cup was happening, and we were able to cover that, and it was some great stuff that um, y- so Yagi Narita match. Yo, that, yo, I will always go back to the Yagi Narita matches. Those matches are so phenomenal and underrated, and it's like... When you want to talk about hidden gems and, you know, <laughs> bangers that nobody knows about, like, those matches rule. But I, I love I love the Young Lions Cup. I just do. Yeah, and we had a comment here from Reddit user Zach Saber Time. He said, since there isn't much that happened in the last week, it would be cool if you guys go over the big step up the Young Lions have had this year. From the L.A. Dojo appearing on NJ World to Umino and Narita being in tournaments, thought it would be cool to delve into the Young Lions topic a bit and would be informative for new viewers of New Japan. Um, also had a question from Reddit user A Blue Three asking us for Young Lions Cup predictions. So um, let's take a look at uh, some of the guys that are going to be in the Young Lions Cup and kind of talk about these guys. And let's start with uh, the you know the big name, the last winner of the tournament, Katsuya Kitamura. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't uh, planning on talking about Kitamura. <laughs> in this, no, <laughs> he has to come back to defend his belt. <laughs> well, Will Osprey's going to be in this, right? 
No, sir. <laughs> but he's supposed to be in every tournament this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is the 12th Young Lions Cup, and it's going to be happening during the Road to Destruction Tour. We have eight Young Lions that will be competing. It's a single-block league tournament. Uh, we have... The New Japan Young Lions, the LA Dojo Young Lions, and uh, one of the Young Lions from the Fale Dojo happening in this tournament. Um, so first up, I mean, let's talk about Shota Umino, the ace of the current crop of Young Lions. He was in the 2017 Young Lions Cup. He had a 2-3 and three record. That year it was a six-man field. And, uh, you know, this year has been a great year for Umino uh, being in the New Japan Cup and kind of falling under Moxley's wing. And it's been having an overall great year. What are you guys thinking about Shota Umino? Yeah, so surely, oh, yeah. Go, go ahead. In. Oh, I was thinking surely Shota is one of the favorites. Shota. <laughs> but it depends. <laughs> it depends on what they're doing with the. Uh, tournament. Like, do they do a uh, Japanese Young Line versus LA Dojo Young Line in the final? Or do they go with like the guys who have been there the longest at the top? Like, for me, the top two would be Umino and Narita. But if they do someone from either side, it depends on how they actually... I've got no idea which one they'll go with. Also, have we ever seen Michael Richard? I don't think I know that name. No, so he is from the Fale Dojo. Was he on the... All right. Was he on the uh, Southern Showdown or Super Showdown? Or uh, his name was not familiar, so I don't think he was. Okay, unless he was on the card. Well, unless he was on the. Um, they had some young lions. The, the second show just went up recently. He might have been on there. Okay. Uh, gotcha. But yeah, there's a footballer called Michael Richards, and the name is so close <laughs> that I'm going to support Michael Richards just because of that. <laughs> That's enough for me. Sounds like a footballer I quite like. <laughs> you got my support, Michael Richards. But uh, yeah, so I, I yeah, I think uh, Shooter is definitely going to be the favorite coming in this tournament. Obviously, you know, being in a heavyweight singles tournament, being groomed um, under the wing of the current IWGP US champion John Moxley, um, and you know, clearly New Japan has big things in mind for Umino. And being one of the two entrants that actually have experience in a Young Lions Cup, I definitely think he's going to be the heavy favorite going into this tournament. So the next up there is Ren Narita. Ren Narita being the second guy who's had experience in the Young Lions Cup. He was in that 2017 Young Lions Cup, only scoring uh, one point off of a draw, so he had a record of 0-4-1. But um, Narita, he got some experience this year in the best of the Super Juniors tournament um, as a late substitute, but did looked really great in that tournament. Um, you know, busted out that new um, belly-to-belly bridging suplex, which has done amazing. And Narita's been one of the Young Lions that the young boy and I have kind of um, gone to bat for over and over again, talking about how impressive he is. A lot of people, when they talk about the young lines and the young boys, they always talk about um, Umino. They were talking about, some of them were talking about Oka, but everybody kind of seemed to forget about Ren Narita. And I think this guy, technically bell to bell, um, tactician, mat work, is the in ring best young lion right now. Um, I think he's very underrated, and I think he's going to do very well in this Young Lions Cup. Yeah, I've I've got to agree with you, and I uh, and it's my fault I didn't chime in when it came to Shoto Amino. So I'll kind of lump these two guys in together. I mean, uh, Shoto Amino and Ren Narita, they're the two guys that are in this Young Lions Cup who competed in it previously. Um, obviously, they were both pretty young. And it was at the start of their their uh, you know young lion days when that previous tournament uh, was taking place. Now they're at the top of the the class and the top of the field, and uh, you know they've had quite a, quite a few different experiences since that time to now to where obviously they're going to be at the top, and both of them I think are going to do very 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 well. Um, I imagine Shota Mino is most likely going to be either winning this or at right at the top there. Uh, I could see Narita, though, doing extremely well. And, I, I mean, mo- most of the guys that are in this tournament, I could see him picking up uh, big wins over. But um, it, for, for for my money, Narita has been one of the best, like, tournament performers uh, for a young lion. I mean, like you said, how, how the amazing run he had through the best of Super Juniors. And then even um, in the last... Uh, 
um, Young Lions Cup, he 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 was awesome. So um, I'm really looking forward to see the progression um, from both of these guys from where they were just a few you know short years ago. And I'm uh, yeah, I'm really stoked about this. And what do you think about Narita? Pretty much everything you two have just said. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah, he's one who's gone under the radar for a little bit, and I feel like the mix of the Young Lion Cup last year and the best of Super Juniors like really lifted him up as like one of the top Young, young Lions right now, and that's why I've got him and Umino like really at the top again, depending on do they push any any dojo guys or not. But yeah, he's he's in the position. He, like he's kind of evolved where uh, like he was in the spot like Yamora was is kind of for this year and the race is like really really risen in quite a short amount of time and um, yeah I'm expecting good things from him of course me saying that Narita had a good tournament last year and like we could see someone like Yamora kind of rise up and maybe spoil a little bit and they tend to do that sometimes in these tournaments but yeah Umino and Narita they're the two like really standing out and uh, like the leader, especially, like 100 percent agree, he's one of the most. He's possibly the most sound one they've got in the Young Lions. Uh, in the Lions, in the uh, LA, I can't probably say it <laughs> in the Young Lions <laughs> uh, stuff. So he, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what he does because he's one of those who's kind of nearing that point where he's good to go on excursion. So you have to see a strong final uh, stirring for him before he goes, or we kind of uh, elevate somebody else. Because again, he's ready. Yeah, I'm expecting him a good performance, if, even if he doesn't win. Yeah, I think uh, Umino and Arita are both getting to that point where they're kind of ready to head off um, to excursion. So yeah, I think this is going to be a great turn for both of these guys. And I think the next two guys kind of go hand in hand as well. Yota Suji and Yuya Uemura. These are two uh, more of the recent um, New Japan Young Lions. These guys um, have been in a big rivalry. Um, beating each other back and forth, back and forth, over and over again, just having some great matches. Um, Yota Suji, he is the uh, the bigger of the two, the bigger guy with the full beard. And um, Suji has really improved a lot in his time in New Japan. I can remember when we when he first kind of came on the scene, um, didn't really kind of know exactly what he was doing, kind of blum- uh, you know bumbling a little bit. Uh, but he's gotten so much better and has great fire. And he's going to be um, a solid heavyweight once he goes on excursion and comes back. And then you have Yomura, the smaller of the two. I um, believe he has an amateur background, but he is a solid uh, guy in the ring, has some great suplexes, some great fire. And the rivalry between these ties have been great, and I think they're definitely going to try to one-up each other in this tournament. Yeah, it's interesting how, um, and I don't know why I didn't notice it, but there's like little pairings for each of these uh, eight competitors. It's easy to kind of uh, pair Umino and Narita together, just given their place and, and their history here. And then uh, Suji and Yamura are very similar because they broke in, they literally debuted with uh, against one another they had the long running feud, and fittingly enough, they're starting off the first night of the tournament against one another on, um, or at least the first match for. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's incorrect. Uh, they'll be facing each other on the second night of the tournament on September 8th. Um, but even still, that's just going to be another installment in the long running feud between Yumor and Suji. Um, both of these guys have improved in strides over the, you know, uh, I don't even know how long they've been uh, called about a year. Maybe I, I feel like it's been a, at least a year maybe longer. Yeah, it's hard to say. But, um, you know, both of these guys had deficiencies, had things that we thought they needed to improve in. And they've literally both improved in almost all those areas to become very, very well-rounded performers. Um, unfortunately, I got to tell you, I think they're both going to be very low on the totem pole. Um, I think that they're going to not do as well as Clark Connors and Fredericks or Narita and Omino. Um, even though they've been wrestling in the dojo system a little bit longer than, um, say, you know, these L.A. Young Lions, it seems like there is... Well, first off, I'll say that the L.A. Lions seem to be a little bit more progressed just in general. And even aside from that, they seem to be getting pushed more. So I see uh, Suji and Yamura kind of being in the similar roles that Narita and Umino were in a couple years ago, where they're hot prospects really really promising guys you can see all the potential in the world and they probably will pick up wins over guys like Alex Coughlin and Michael Richards because they're kind of unknowns 
But at, at the end of the day, I don't see them doing super hot in this tournament. What are you thinking, Em? Yeah, pretty much again what <laughs> Joseph yeah. said. Yeah, for me, I, I've been impressed with Suji in the way that he's taken, that he takes the fight to the likes of Ishii. I feel like a lot of uh, young lads go through that stage where they're like, I'm going to step up to this big main, this big guy who's really respected and I'm going to show him who's boss. And uh, Suji's been doing, he's kind of in that phase where he's really attacking the, uh, the opponent. Obviously, it's the phrase over here of chat shit, get banged. And that's exactly <laughs> what he's doing. Like he, he's talking crap, and then Ishii just beats the living crap out of him for five minutes. Or Suzuki because he's an idiot. Why would you do that, Suji? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> but he, you know, he's kind of in that phase. Imora is he feels a bit. Um, he's, he's another one who's going really, really sound. Uh, uh, he's really standing out this uh, young lions kind of era, where it's like there isn't normally there's like maybe one and maybe a step behind or so where you can kind of tell. Like with this crop, like no, like you could easily pair them off. Like it's Uji and Ramora are really are developing really well. And Rita and Umino, we're talking about them like as like future champions, kind of good. <laughs> so it's like the, the these young lions are like really developed really really well. And then the LA dojo guys, like they come in and it's like really impressed during the G1. So it's like this crop of young lions, like New Japan, have got themselves set again. <laughs> it's looking great for them. Uh, I've shifted from Suji because I pretty much, you pretty much said everything <laughs> that I needed to say. But yeah, he's not going to finish that high. He should be impressive during it. And he he reminds me a bit of a uh, Japanese Dave Grohl. That's just, when I see him, I think you could be a version of the Japanese Foo Fighters. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever noticed that before. Now I'm probably not going to get that out of my head now. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, that's a really weird thing. It must be just me that thinks that. <laughs> So uh, the next uh, kind of pairing we can talk about are Clark Connors and Carl Fredericks. Both of these guys are from the L.A. Dojo being trained by Katsuyora Shibata. And we saw these guys during the G1 Climax Tour this year. They were in tag undercards, uh, mainly teaming with Kenta and then sometimes just teaming with each other. They've kind of started a rivalry with the New Japan Young Lions, especially with uh, Suji and Yamura. Um, I know them kind of beating Yamura at the end of the tournament, and Yamura wanting them to come back. And, you know, if you want to be true Young Lions, you need to come back to Japan. So here they are coming back to Japan. Um, Clark Connors was um, got a spot in the Super J Cup as well. And... Um, out of the two, I, I'm really impressed. I think they're both impressive, but I really love uh, Carl Fredericks. I think this guy has the money look. Um, great in-ring worker. I think he's a guy that if he stays in this system, he can be uh, a future um, top gaijin for uh, New Japan. What are you thinking, Em? Um, yes, again, <laughs> exactly what you're thinking. Uh, Clark Connors is also great because Kevin Kelly mucks up his name, calling him like Clark Collins and stuff. So, <laughs> added entertainment. <laughs> so, but yeah, um, Carl Fredericks especially, like he really stood out. Like especially if, if you're a guy with a guess like a physique like his, like if you're a bit behind, you might stand out a bit more. But no, he seemed like really, uh, really well. Oh, I can't think of the word. Like he's well drilled and trained. I guess <laughs> to put it simply. Like he, he was like really impressive when he was taking part in G1 tag. And uh, Clark Connors feels a bit like uh, a really, really young. T- oh, uh, the guy I thought of was Timothy Thatcher when I saw mm. him, just like a, but, but like really, that. really young. So he's so obviously that's quite a high ceiling <laughs> to be thinking of for sort of month. And so I'm really impressed with both guys. I think these they're just like you know, put everybody into pairs. They're Connors and Fedrix for me. They're both in like another pair, and uh, they're more equivalent to Umino and Rita, where I think they'll finish higher up. But I don't really know how high. Um, I'm expecting, yeah, it depends on how hard they push these LA Dojo guys. And I'm expect if it's like the G1, then we might get a Japan versus USA final. Or, again, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, both are impressing. Uh, I uh, don't know who would do better than the other. I feel like they're one of these pairs that are interchangeable. But, uh, yeah, I'm impressed with both so far. We just haven't seen that much where I can really speak about them. But from what I have seen, yeah, they both look really impressive. Yep, I really like the LA Dojo Lions. Super impressive. I agree with every point that you made there, Jeremy. You know, uh, 
uh, Carl Fred. It's Carl Fredericks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that there's a very good likelihood that he will be, uh, well, the final night, Tim and show to Amino. Right. Ooh. So, I mean, you got to figure that that's, uh, that's really telling you something there. And then on the other side, you've got Narita and Clark Connors on the same night. And, you know, those four guys are at the top of the class. I really think that you're going to be seeing, you know, the, the implications of who's going to win this but when it comes down to those four, four gentlemen. And uh, I really look forward to seeing singles action from all of these competitors. But, um, you know, I've only seen Clark Connors and Carl Fredericks in tag teams so far. So um, I can't really wait to see the, you know, singles matchups from these guys. Yeah, it's going to be great. And then uh, the last two guys, they're really not, um, they don't work out as paired as well as the other guys. Uh, we have Alex Coughlin, who's also a representative of the LA Dojo. He was not a part of the G1 Climax Tour. Uh, so you know he's going to be you know chomping at the bit to you know really impress on his first tour um, here in Japan. So and I believe he was on the Super J Cup tour and some undercard matches as well. And then the last guy is Michael Richards, and he is from the Fale Dojo, and he was at the Southern Showdown show in Melbourne. Um, so both these guys, for, I guess they kind of are paired up because it's both of their first times in Japan. What are we thinking about these guys? Yeah, so um, we haven't. Did you just said we haven't seen either of them in Japan? So, in Japan, uh, but Rich, they, Richard was on the Southern Showdown show in Melbourne. Yeah, I remember being um, impressed with Coughlin and not impressed with Richards, to be honest with you. Um, but neither of them really blew me away in any tangible way. So it, uh, I think they have a lot to prove. And they have a really big opportunity ahead of them. And this is an incredible learning experience for both of them. But um, you've got to imagine that they're, if they might not pick up a single point. Uh, if they do, it might be like one or, or, you know, they might be playing spoiler or something like that. But um, if, if, if history tells us anything, these young Lion Cups are really more based on pecking order than upsets and things like that. It's not necessarily a... Uh, I mean, you never know. Who knows how they're going to book it? But if, if history tells us anything, we're going to learn where they see each one of these guys when it comes to the ecosystem of the, the Young Lions in New Japan. And uh, I think both of these guys are going to get a great opportunity here, but I don't think that they're going to go very far in the tournament. What are you thinking, Em? Yeah, I've seen so little of these guys. When I'm looking at the image with like, the Young Lions on it, I would not know which one was which. <laughs> if it wasn't for the uh, table at the top end being the same order. Uh, yeah, uh, I think these two guys will be, we'll get to know them obviously throughout this tournament, but they're, they're the promising kind of guys who are just going to get beaten and show that they can help make the others look good in defeat. Uh, AKA, these are the guys doing the, uh, they're doing all of the young line moves and really not really much else more. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm expecting from these guys as in, can they do stuff good? <laughs> it sounds really, bold, really simple. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, I don't really... Uh, when I've seen the Michael Richards, I am literally just picturing that footballer. I, I, it, mean, it, mean, it mean, doesn't really mean much to me at all. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much all I've got to say. You, you two have nailed it again. Not really much more to add. Yeah, so it looks like this tournament is starting September 4th. It looks like an ending on the 22nd, which is the destruction in... Kobe show. Uh, we had a question here from Reddit user Senor Sombrero 3K. It says the match schedule for the Young Lion Cup seems to indicate that it'll come down to Shooter and Fredericks on the 22nd, with possibly Narita and Connors fighting for top junior Young Lion. Who do you guys think will win, and what's the future for Fredericks? They were definitely impressed with him during the G1 run recently in tags, and personally, I can see him fighting for top guys in role. Keep up the great work, lads. Missing the three-hour-long podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to keep it under three hours this week. <laughs> but, um, no, that's a great question, and uh, we appreciate that. I, I got to tell you, I kind of think, maybe I'm crazy here, I think Carl Frederick's winning this. Yeah, they've been really... Um, kind of behind Carl Fredericks and he's been picking up a lot of the, the if you look at if you go back to the tournament most of the time when that team won it was Fredericks who was picking up the win yeah. so 
I, I think, yeah, uh, Fred, it's going to come down between Fredericks and Umino, I believe. And, yeah, I, I can see them going with Fredericks, especially if Umino is going to get ready to go on excursion. Uh, you kind of bring Fredericks in as the new ace of the Young Lions. Yeah, I just, you know, they, they, they were kind of setting up Kitamura for something similar. And um, I think that this is an easy way for them to establish uh, – Fredericks, obviously they've they think the world of Shoto Umino, and I mean they could go with him, but I don't see him in that dominating role where he wins the whole tournament. I could be I don't know, I could be wrong here, obviously, but something just tells me it's gonna be Carl Fredericks. My gut, my gut instinct tells me Fredericks is taking this whole thing. Yeah, and I, I think Fredericks has a, a really bright future. Like I mentioned, like if he stays the path he's going and stays in this system. I think he's a guy they can groom to be a potential IWGP challenger, maybe even champion. I think I think come by January he won't be a young lion anymore. Mm. That's my that's my prediction. How you it might be a you know when we watch it's all like a juice as a young lion and it just seems so developed. Like it really doesn't feel like it'll be that long as a young lion. Right. That's a, that's a great that's a great point. That's exactly how I feel. I feel like he's so developed at this point. He's not even really a a young lion, really, is kind of beyond that already, a little bit. So that's yeah, that's that's a great point. Plus, shoot has been influenced. He's he's a he's a bad boy now. <laughs> How much would you guys love it if like he started coming out like with the jacket and like a kendo stick? Oh like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> if he does that, then I think he's winning. <laughs> sorry, Especially sorry. in the. Uh, in the smaller arenas they run for these tournaments if he tries to do a version like Mark but it's just like three rows <laughs> I love it the one thing I'm not excited about for this it looks like they're doing it just on the Destruction Tour and I liked last year where they were doing the uh, the Lionsgate project shows and it doesn't look like we're getting any of those so that kind of does detract from the tournament a little bit for me yeah but I do think it's good yeah, have to have it on the ro- on the road two shows. Give fans, you know, sometimes fans they skip the road two More shows, exposure. and a lot of times it's a you get the same multi mans usually over and over on these road two shows. So it it adds something new to the road two show and kind of gives you a reason to tune in um, to the road two shows. I agree. I, I, that's a great point. But I still like I like those. I like those Lions Project shows. Yeah, I like the Lions Project cool. shows too. And so I'll definitely tell all our listeners not so screw you, <laughs> <laughs> not to sleep on this tournament. I mean, the tw- go back and watch the 2017 tournament up on New Japan World. Uh, this is some solid wrestling, like 15 minute matches, 15 minute time limit. This is basically the high speed title version of <laughs> of New Japan. So yeah, it's gonna be good. Uh, and did you have any more thoughts on uh, Carl Fredericks and his future? Uh, yeah, um, I completely agree. Well, he feels so developed that it, I really don't see him being in line that long. Uh, I'm interested to see what happens after that. Cause we don't know. Uh, uh, are they going to call up the LA Young Lions just like they do everybody else? They'd be like the first guy brought in by the LA Dojo to actually like, make it to the next stage, which is uh, kind of cool to see how that happens. Uh, obviously, because he's a guy, Jim, there's always a chance he'll become a baddie. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Is it, it used to be a thing, but uh, they've got they've got uh, foreigners in the chaos now, so who knows? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's either that or Taguchi, where they normally end up <laughs> just dancing with Taguchi in the middle of the ring. <laughs> like, I can't see Fredrick doing that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one. But yeah, I, he's not going to be in line for that long, whatever happens next. I expect him to do pretty well for himself. Is it weird that I'm so much more geeked up for Young Lions Cup than I was the Super J Cup? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. At least we'll actually get to see the Young Lions Cup live. <laughs> that, that's a valid point. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Zach Saber Time had a second part to his question. Um, he says he forgot to ask this two weeks ago. He says. Uh, since Jay White beat Tai Chi in the G1, does this make Jay the master of shenanigans? No. <laughs> Imp, <Yeah>. any, <laughs> your thoughts? Not whilst Yano's alive. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. Actually, I, I was trying to think of something really funny to say, and I couldn't think of like a compelling thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, Yano's the master of shenanigans. Yeah, I mean, if if it's just down between Jay and Tai Chi, I I still think I was even though Jay beat Tai Chi, I still think Tai Chi would have it. But overall, y- Yano is is the master of shenanigans. I've, I've got Taguchi over Tai Chi, really, as a master of shenanigans. Absolutely. Don't you guys? No, 
What, what do you think, Imp? Um, uh, do butt stuff count? <laughs> <laughs> he does all the butt stuff. <laughs> he does all the butt stuff. <laughs> oh, man. Let's let's move on. <laughs> Listen, there's nothing wrong with bus stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, so we had a few more uh, question here from listeners. Uh, first from Reddit user Asai Yojimbo. He says, "What are your thoughts on the possible IWGP Intercontinental plus World Title Unification match at Wrestle Kingdom 14?" Also, so far the G1 briefcase has never changed hands in the fall. I think it would be interesting if someday this finally happens. What do you guys think about that as a plot twist heading into Wrestle Kingdom? What would your ideal situation be for a G1 briefcase upset? So first, let's talk about the IC and world title potential unification match at Wrestle Kingdom 14. Uh, Amp, what are your thoughts on that, on that potential of that happening? Well, we'd have to have the road to Wrestle Kingdom completely change from the trajectory it's on now, which I've, obviously the entire time I've been watching, I've never seen that happen. So it would be a bit odd. Obviously, there's a first time for everything, but I don't quite see that being this year. It doesn't really make sense to me that much that like you get yeah, this. I don't, I don't really like the idea of the uh, mini tournament either. Is it, it sounds too, I guess, fan theory-like <laughs> to me, is it? Like the type of thing where, uh, like last week, people were going uh, saying, oh, WWE failed to capitalize on this. And it was something where the fans had thought, oh, this might happen. And then it didn't happen. It was like, well, they could be never said they were ever going to do that. That was all you. <laughs> so kind of, uh, this, that seems something like that to me. And this IC thing, it's all come from Naito saying that he would want to hold both at the same time. However, he didn't win the G1. So he's not got a clear route to it. So maybe it could be more just a thing of him showing his disdain for the IC title more than it was an actual like thing that could happen. And but obviously just people just ran with it, me included. So that's why that's why certainly he's gonna win the G one because he said that, but the, so that was just a throwaway thing. Yeah. Uh I don't think it will happen because of how it's been set up, like where we're at now. Uh, I don't things don't really change that often in New Japan from where the seems to be going yeah I, but i do think there is some smoke to, to the fire with this double title thing so initially it was just naito mentioning it then abushi mentioned it in the press conference after he won the g1 and now we have jay white um in press magazine saying that he wants to um be the first double champion so we're starting to get a lot of guys saying they want to be double champions. So there might be some smoke to this fire. Young boy, what do you think about a potential unification match at Wrestle Kingdom 14? Right. Well, at this point, I'm sort of in the camp where I'm not going to count on it happening. Um, It's not something I'm anticipating. I think it makes a lot of logical sense. And we laid out some of those reasons on previous episodes just because – I think I think Imp, you're right when you say Naito's the only guy that's really really pushed for it. But there's been some offhand comments that Abushi's had, even last week in the um, in some of the uh, news like media, just like some of the magazines that are published over there in Tokyo. Naito had mentioned that he was willing to wrestle. Um, Abushi for the you know in a double title match provided they both won and they would go and face each other on the second night so they actually have started to kind of talk about this but they've they're given so much creative freedom in in New Japan you never know if what they're being if what they're saying is the actual direction and booking of the company or if it's just them just shooting and just saying whatever they'd like to say and so you just never know so right now I'm going to say no but I think it would be a good idea especially given the fact that they have two nights, especially given the, the fact that they can book the IWGP title to headline two nights in a row using that as a catalyst. And I think the biggest thing is Okada Naito is the most protected match in all of New Japan, regardless of the, the outcome of the G1. And, you know, um, the, the, the two matches that look most likely, hypothetically speaking, would be what... Um, well, I'm I'm guessing you said during Destruction Tour we're getting Naito and Jay White, right? Yeah. So, I mean, we don't really know what Naito's future holds, but obviously the fact that we already got a match this year between Okada and Ibushi, it does seem kind of anticlimactic for them to turn around and do that match again as the main event. But in the context of a tournament, and it's only the first night, and it's not the main main event, 
that actually makes a lot of sense to me. So I know I, I sound like I'm talking myself into it. Like from a logical standpoint, I just, I see how it could work and I see why it would make sense, but there's not enough there for that, for me to feel like they're promising us this. And if they don't do it, I'm not going to turn around and be like, Oh, they didn't deliver. Cause they have not promised. This is, this is fans wanting this. Right. And it, week after week, more and more fans are talking about it. And don't get me wrong. I kind of like the idea and the concept of it. And I think it would be a, a different twist, especially with two nights of wrestle kingdom. But if they don't do it, I'm not going to come on here and, you know, rant and rave that they didn't I do am. it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Since apparently that's what I do, right? <laughs> Only when it comes to John Moxley. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I definitely think we need to keep our eyes open because a lot more guys are mentioning wanting to be the first double champion. So that could be the theme going into Wrestle Kingdom 14, who's going to be the first double champion. That could be kind of the story they tell in the fall, going into the winter and building up to these two dome shows. Um, so the second part of Asayo Jimbo's question, he's talking about uh, the briefcase and what would be our ideal situation um, for somebody losing the briefcase. What do you think, young boy? I This is one of those topics. Every now and again, when we finally get to this time of the year, we start to talk about this. I just I find myself in this place where... I understand that people think that they should do this. And in a way, New Japan has booked themselves into a corner to where eventually they have to do it. That's why I hate the rule. I hate the concept. I, I understand what it facilitates. You know, it gives the guy who won the G1 a chance to uh, strengthen his run going into the Wrestle Kingdom main event. But, you know... I don't want to see anybody who wins the G1 not get a title shot at Wrestle Kingdom. Like, that seems like some dark age booking type of bullshit that I ne- don't ever want to see return to New Japan. So I would be totally fine. You can you can say, you know, there's probably people who are listening right now and think, well, that's pretty predictable, you know, and that can get boring. Better that than it be bad. Like, I'd rather the board, the it, it be predictable than just actually bad. Like, wh- there's no reason to switch the uh, briefcase off of somebody. And, you know, as a viewer of this company, like, I don't want to sit back and watch the G1 for two months and see someone win this incredible tournament and then they hand over their their contract to somebody else. That sound that's bullshit. Like that's so stupid. Why would I, why would I be invested in that? But the problem is they got to do it at some point and they're going to do it. And I hate that idea. Um, I would rather they just never do it. That's yep. my, that's my feelings. Imp, I hate it. How do you feel about it? It's pretty much exactly the same. Like it doesn't feel like a thing that fits into the current way. New Japan kind of books and builds or tells their stories. Like the only way I feel I might feel fine with it is if it felt like it had been set up in some way beforehand, or you've got inklings that it could happen. For it to randomly happen, it, that doesn't feel like it fits in the world that they've set up. Like obviously, in a world like WWE, where they've also got like the briefcase that you can cash in to get your world title opportunity, they set up a world where random crap happens all the time. So it wouldn't be, it's not out of character for suddenly you've got the, suddenly you set up at the beginning of the show, by the end of the show, it switch hands. Like that can happen in WWE. In New Japan, that's not the kind of thing that they go for, like at all. So it would really surprise me to be a case, like, but when I say ever change hands, I mean, especially in a state like this, like set it up to a point where they could lose it. Like, especially when it's a match like, it's like the G1 Climax, where it's such a road to get the thing. There's a bit weird that they could lose it, especially when it, it feels so earned. It would be like the person holding the briefcase, it wouldn't feel earned, and that brings down the Wrestle Kingdom match. It, that kind of thing doesn't really fit in the New Japan world for me. doesn't mean they couldn't do it, but it would require quite a bit of setup for it to kind of work, or the way that kind of, I try and picture it. It's, yeah, that kind of random thing is not the booking philosophy that I've seen. Yeah, and I agree with both of you guys. And, you know, with it being such a, you know, great tournament and such a long, grueling thing, and you get a guy who's went through this this long journey to um, win, the, win the G1 and get the trophy and the briefcase, you know, it, it would kind of suck for him to just to lose it to somebody else and completely just change the way they normally book. However, if they were going to do it, I think... This is the year? No, uh, oh, gotcha. I, think, I think the ideal situation, if they were gonna, ever going to do it, is you have a guy like Jay White 
where he literally cheats to win every single match. There's not one match he wins clean. He cheats and wins every single match, goes to the G1 finals, cheats to win the finals, and then you have the whole New Japan fan base so pissed at Jay White. Because he wants someone to get come up in time. Right. He doesn't deserve the briefcase. Mm. He cheated to beat everybody. He's this no good heel. You have the you have everybody in a frenzy hating Jay White. And then King of Pro Wrestling, you have your triumphant baby face who came in second, who should have won, beat him for the briefcase, and you have him go to Wrestle Kingdom to get the shot. I think I think from a logical standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. And I'm actually kind of impressed, you know, that you came up with that because I'm like, you know what, that could work. Here's the only really bad part about it. Those matches that he's cheating in to win would have to be incredible Mm -hmm. because that's a lot to ask of fans to say to have a guy cheat the entire tournament and then actually win it. Right. Because it's the freaking G1. It's like the freaking Catalina (laughs) wine mixer, you know? And, um, you know... That would be hard. To me, it almost would be hard for them to recover from that because the, that tournament is held in such high esteem and high regard. Even that is a is a stretch for me. And I could see that actually working. Right. And for me, like that would be the only way. And, I, and right. I, I'm not advocating for it or saying they should do that. But if they're going to do I feel like you have to get heat on somebody, on a heel. Because I would hate, like, you wouldn't have a guy like Ishii or Tanahashi, whoever, Ibushi or whatever, win this thing and then just lose it. It has to be a guy that everybody, like, somebody, everybody hates. You get a lot of heat on a guy, and then people want to actually see him lose the briefcase. But I see your point. Sitting through nine matches of Jay cheating, it will upset the fan base and will kind of sour um, what the G1 represents. And, yeah, and I think that would turn people off. To some degree, I mean, but you know, that that moment that you're painting where this guy cheated to win the G1 and then someone gets their redemption over him and you know uh, takes the the briefcase back, sure, that sound that that would be great. Um, you know, that would be a great moment. But I don't know if you sacrifice the G1 for that. You know what I mean? Right. That's the hard. That's what I'm struggling with. All right. So uh, moving on. Uh, next question from Reddit user Di. Di- Dio, Diego Kuna, zero, zero, I think. <laughs> we do not know how to pronounce your name, sir. Uh, says, how do you feel about Kenny being the fourth participant in the mini tournament at the Dome, challenging Naito on the fourth, and the winner faces the winner of Abushi versus Okada? Alleged tournament. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think that's going to be tough uh, with Kenny wrestling for DDT here in the next few weeks. Um, I think that might throw a little, a little bit of a monkey wrench in there. Um, I got to tell you, I don't think, I don't think we're going to see Kenny. Um, I don't even really like that uh, scenario very much either. Honestly, um, I think if you bring Kenny in for my money, there's only two things that you bring him in for personally. You bring him in to either headline a big money match for the IWGB title, in a, and it's got to be like an Okada level guy, or you bring him in to pay off the Abushi feud. Those are the only two things. Um, the match with him and Naito, obviously, they always have bangers. That'd be incredible. But like, why bring him in to have an IC title match on one night with Naito, and then you know? Like he would have to win, so then he'd have to be the IC champion. That doesn't really make sense. And then for one night, because then he'd probably lose. Then he'd probably lose it. Yeah, and then, I don't know. That seems this is not happening. Like, and I don't think I would want that to be honest. Right. And I'm a huge Kenny Omega fan. Kenny Omega is one of my favorite wrestlers today. And personally, I wouldn't want to see him come in for this. Like, I agree with you. If Kenny's coming in, it's got to be a big money one-time singles match, not this mini tournament thing where he's going to win a belt and then lose it the next night. Um, so yeah, what do you how, how do you feel about this imp? Yeah, pretty much the same. I don't really like this idea of the mini tournament. He hits the and tournament. If, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's anyone, surely it's Jay White is going to be the fourth guy. Right. Like he's been set up to be in there. It makes no sense it's be Kenny. Also, like we're currently in a little era, like a weird era, where we're not seeing much Kenny Omega. We're only getting him like once a month, if that. 
that era comes to an end come October. So by the time Wrestle Kingdom's around, we're going to be sick of Kenny Omega. <laughs> He's been on TV every week. <laughs> the fans will turn on him in really quickly. <laughs> like, boo. He's, he's not he's overrated or whatever people say uh, terms like that <laughs> anyway yeah I don't think it'll be him especially as the word was the AW New Japan kind of relationship didn't exactly get started on a great foot so it might be a while until we see them working together which makes me sad about the uh, Moxler, Moxley and Shooter excursion <laughs> that really <laughs> everyone really wants yeah yeah I don't I don't see it happening I don't really want it to happen and if it does happen it won't be Kenny yeah, I won't be sick of Kenny because I won't be watching AEW. Mm. New Japan elitist. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here comes my hot take. Oh, so I don't, oh. Th- I, I, don't oh. I don't think Kenny is going to be the fourth guy in the tournament. And with Jay challenging Naito, I was wondering at Destruction and Kobe. Okay, I don't think Jay is going to be the fourth guy. If this mini tournament gimmick is happening, the fourth guy is going to be the Cole Skull Sonata. No, nah, it needs to be Tomohiro Ishii. It needs to be, but based <laughs> off this year's booking, I think Sonata is going to be the fourth guy. Okay, but... Or could be the fourth guy. That kind of makes sense, but then you're talking about uh, a Naito and Sonata matchup, which obviously, you know that. You're the one who's proposing that. And I don't think you're necessarily wrong, because there's a lot of reasons why that could make sense. It's just... I'm sitting here like my even thinking about that makes my stomach turn a little bit. Like it's one thing to see these guys go up against one another in the G1. It's a whole different thing to see them go up against each other in a title match at Wrestle Kingdom. That literally as a fan, and I'm not even like a LIJ fanboy, but that that's like some dangerous territory. I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's like a split waiting to happen. I don't know. Ugh, that makes well, I mean, me nervous. They've been elevating Sonata so much, and you know he's he beat Okada. I don't, I don't think he's getting a title shot Fuck again Sonata. this year. <laughs> but I, I I think put him on the dome on a big uh, semi main where oh, he's yeah. facing off against Naito for the IC title. I think that has money behind it. I think that that will draw, and I think that tells a compelling story in the future of Los Ingobernables de Japón. So um, I think Sonata's the fourth guy. If if this mini tournament happens, I I, I immediately when we were going over, it, I was thinking, well, the guy that makes the most sense. I, I, obviously, you heard my train of thought when I started talking about uh, Naito and Jay White, and then I realized that you mentioned that they're going up against each other at Destruction. And I'm like, oh, well then. They're, then they're definitely not doing Wrestle Kingdom, and then then it does leave it open. Who now? Here's the thing: oh, people, people don't want to hear this, but what if Jay White beats Naito? <laughs> I just, I just, you hear that? That's, that's the sound of Lij fans deleting this podcast. Uh, not, don't delete the don't delete our podcast. Listen, I'm not Gato. I didn't book this. Oh my gosh! If I booked it, then you know it would have ended up being Naito and Okada this year. But that's that's neither here nor there. But like, dude, I could see that happening. I could see Jay White being Naito and and going into Wrestle Kingdom oh with the white belt. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh man <laughs> so, They've already downloaded it It's fine, we're two hours in You've got the statistics <laughs> you got, you got your wants. download, kid <laughs> <laughs> Oh man Alright, uh, any more thoughts On this uh, unification Mini tournament uh, Thing uh, y- y- Your idea is not happening <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. not our idea, sir It's the general collective of the New Japan Fan base audience you need a you need a plug in, <laughs> like the Matrix. <laughs> uh, so next question we have from uh, Reddit user Rambone Slam Pig. He says, "Is there any talk of Amazing Red or TJ Perkins making further appearances for New Japan Pro Wrestling?" Yeah, uh, this guy named Rambone Slam Pig. He was uh, talking to us about it, and he sent in a question, and asked that very same thing. Um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't heard anything official. Have you heard anything official? I have not heard anything official. I do know that, um, you know, trying to dance around spoilers here, Amazing Red does compete throughout the whole tour. Whether he won his first match or not, he is on the Super J Cup tour all three nights. I don't know how he's feeling. I don't know if he's if he's good enough to where he thinks he can get a junior run in New Japan, I don't know. I know that TJP tweeted out 
um, you know, a picture of him kissing the line mark, saying that this would always be his home. So I, I think there's great potential, especially with TJP being a former um, young line from the original LA Dojo, like we've mentioned before. I think TJP can be one of these guys that they bring in for a Super Junior Tag League, a Best of Super Juniors, a Super J Cup. Um, anytime they do U.S. shows, I think he's a guy that they could bring in and rely on to have great matches and uh, kind of be a Gaijin star in the junior division. You know, we've lost guys like ACH and Saban and Shelly. Um, so TJP can be a guy that kind of fits in that role. Uh, what do you think about TJP and Red? Um, and you had to decide oh, who you're going to decide who you're gonna pass it over to. Uh, yeah, Med's got better than his name, so he's obviously joining Chaos. So that's that one sold. <laughs> uh, yeah, and there's the history as well, TJP. Kind of, I, I, pretty much what Jeremy said, why, uh, if there are going to be appearances, I would expect it for, like, yeah, for the tournaments or for trips to America. Amazing Med, there might be a different thing in there because I've, I've seen that he not only impressed, but it was like... Like the match was like really good against Will Osprey, so uh, it, yeah, he showed him he was amazing. So that that could help him, but of course it's mostly down to him because I know when he said he retired, it was mostly mental more than it was physical. So and that's quite a big thing to overcome. So it will be about how does he see where he is at? How much did it really help him to have that match with Osprey? Like only he will know. So there's not really much. I can add to it, but it, I think it would be an amazing thing to see him come out as part of chaos. This is like, I say as part of chaos, like maybe with, with them as a kind of show, show respect in some kind of way, uh, a nice moment for him to come out in the Tokyo Dome, but that's mostly down to him. But I don't see something like that for TJP. Like, yeah, maybe a super Jacob kind of guy. Uh, as Jonathan Gresham becomes Ring of Honor champion and Rich celebrates and is really happy. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be the best of super juniors. Or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, I reckon they both have more appearances because I think they're both impressed from what I've heard. Uh, I don't know to what degree, though. I I feel like um, given the climate that the wrestling industry is in right now with so many uh, talented wrestlers locked up and, you know... um, exclusive to so many different entities uh we are kind of in a sparse time period where unless a wrestler is exclusive to one of the partners that new japan has it's kind of hard for them to get some of these outside guys um in my opinion tjp is one of those few free market guys that is still out there um the only way i see him not having more appearances is if he signs some sort of exclusive deal with like an AEW or like an impact other than that i I would tell you, I think it's a very, very likely possibility that he comes back in, uh, especially with certain guys that we think are leaving um, the, the the junior di- division, like obviously Shingo just left. Obviously, Will Ospreay is not long for the division. Um, TJP makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Amazing Red, that's the one I'm way, way, way more iffy on, and it's just because I don't know if he wants to continue to work or not. If he does continue to work, there's every possibility in the world that he – either could become a mainstay or he could become like one of those like Chris Saban, Alex Shelley type of guys that only comes around when they're doing U S shows possibly. Yeah. But, um, that's kind of my view. I think TJP is the way more likely of the two. Yeah. I think the ball is in red's court. You know, Brian Alvarez and a lot of people have been saying that the red Osprey match is one of the best matches they've seen live. Um, so I've been hearing just raving reviews about Red's performance this this whole weekend. So, yeah, I think the ball's in his court, whatever he feels and decides. I think if he wants another run, I think they would be happy to, you know, bring him in for some more tours, you know, be in Best of the Super Juniors next year. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. So next question comes from our mutual friend, Sir Sam from LOP. He's not my friend. <laughs> <laughs> he says he has a question. He says, who does Imp think is going to win the Ricky and Clive quiz imitational? Him or the young boy? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, (laughs) I know when I was on and the fan beat me, I'm I'm not bitter about it. (laughs) When Zem was sat in his car with a coffee in the morning (laughs) and he still beat me. (laughs) But he... uh, Yes, and I know Ricky designed some pretty mean New Japan questions for when I was on, uh, and 
I expect him to do the same. So I felt like the New Japan questions were pretty difficult. They actually test me quite a member. So either young boy falls on his oh, what's the sub phase falls on his own petard. <laughs> I don't know if that's phase over in America. No, it's not. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> but I think I put two stains together, hoisted by your own petard and falling on your own sword. So that's an accidental impism <laughs> made up. Uh, yeah. Um, so either young boy falls on his New Japan sword because Ricky was a bit of a dick with his questions, or Sir Sam messes up because he did it in his car again and he was tired. Oh. Here, here's no, I'll. I'll oh, go ahead. What are you going to say? No, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'll, I'll go with young boy because young boy won't be doing it. Oh wait, no, you. It's um. I'm trying to think. It will be a weird time for you. Hmm. I mean, cool. It's going to be at whatever time I wanted to be at. That's what it's be. <laughs> oh, then you've set the field. It's your ring. <laughs> Young boy's winning. <laughs> that like that? If, if uh, they're yeah. going to be like, they're gonna be like you, you have to wake up super early in the morning to do this. I'm gonna be like, nah, chief. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's, it's, oh. it's going to be an interesting showdown. So make sure you guys check out the Ricky and Clive wrestling show and look out for that quiz invitational for the next round our very young young boy taking on Sir Sam from LOP. I do appreciate the vote of confidence from you, Imp. Um, The one thing, I don't want to say anything too much because Ricky listens to this show, and I don't want to say anything to, like, get me any heat. or. Well, you guys already have good-looking heat. That's different, but that's that's not that's on a different level. Like, that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to say anything that like makes him swayed one way. Just follow your heart, Ricky. <laughs> when you come to picking when you come to picking these these questions and setting things up, just go with your heart. You know. All right, go with God. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to jump into the news. So first uh, news item here, Michael Craven. So it was tweeted out by our friends at the Super J cast that Michael Craven was no longer the uh, general manager of New Japan Pro Wrestling. They went into a little bit more detail on their episode this week. And, you know, they mentioned that Michael Craven, he was demoted from his current position as general manager, but he is still with the company. He'll be moving over to a different um, department. And, you know, some of the, you know, rumored, um, you know, Craven decisions during his run as GM was bringing Lanny Poffo on commentary um, and potentially him ending Kevin Kelly's podcast and also the removal of Chris Charlton from commentary. So a lot of kind of unpopular decisions. Um, we've How heard- about losing the entire elite and and <laughs> jump-starting AEW and killing their entire Western expansion? No, I'm just playing. Uh, so we have- Although there might be a little bit of truth to that. Yeah, so we've heard, you know, there's been a lot of stories going around with Michael Craven and um, a lot of rumors of people kind of being unhappy with his presence, unhappy with the way he does things. Um, rumors of just some of the decisions that he's made in his time as a GM. We've also heard a lot of, you know, um, disconjointing of like marketing of um, him yeah. r- running some like America shows and then um, Harold May's team running, you know, the UK and Australia shows and just different ways things have been promoted. So, yeah, it seems like he's out. Uh, we had a question here from Rich Latta says, with Craven's departure, what do you think will be different about New Japan's efforts in America? You know, I... I'm not like the best business guy when it comes to this sort of topic. Um, but I've heard from so many different, um, so many different people that are in the know over the past few years about the questionable tactics, the questionable, um, business decisions that have been made by new Japan when it comes to America. And I, I don't know if it's fair to put all of that on Michael Craven. Um, you know, it probably isn't fair because I don't think he's he was at the helm the entire time. I mean, this was a relatively new appointment, um, and they were already making mistakes long before he got there. But I think part of the idea was that him and Harold Mai were supposed to kind of like correct the ship and write things. And obviously, with the way things have gone and AEW's startup, that's really, really changed the trajectory of and everything that had to do with the elite has changed everything. Um, I can't tell you what it's going to change or be different, but I'm hoping long term it's just better. I I don't know what needs to happen. I couldn't tell you point by point what New Japan needs to be doing. Um, But if I were to make one suggestion, they need to get some sort of team that's very familiar with 
the markets here, the business aspect of promoting pro wrestling in North America and get them to work to do that here. If that's their goal, if they're really trying to build something here, expand here and run out here, then they can't just do it willy nilly and they can't do it, you know, halfway. They have to really have their crap together and they have to have someone who knows how to do that. Yeah. What do you think? Have you been following this uh, situation at all? Uh, only a little bit. I will say, um, I think I think he was on social suplex. Uh, Will hit me up on uh, something that was revealed during the recordings of the uh, Super Jacob, where they announced they'll be doing uh, New Japan sh- Showdown in San Jose on November 9th, which is also perfect competition because WWE are also abroad at that point and doing a certain show. So, like, is there, oh, the WWE on here. Oh, why don't you uh, come to our show? <laughs> I kind of like that idea. Uh, so it, um, maybe we are seeing a slight difference, but the way they announced the show was just like during the show, they flashed up a graphic. And if Wolf hadn't sent me this, I would have had no idea the show was on. So maybe this is still like a craven thing and we've not seen the next generation of stuff kind of filter through yet. But it's, uh, I don't know, have they been to San Jose before? Um, I know. So it's going to be at the San Jose Civic Center. I don't think they've been at that location before, but clearly they've kind of been in that California market several times, you know, oh, being yeah. at the Walter Pyramid for a lot of stuff and a lot of, um, you know, the Super J Cup shows and stuff like that. Uh, and, and, and you know what? Looking at that, that's what, two weeks away? Uh, no, the San Jose show is in November. Oh, for but, some reason. Oh, you know, I'm, I apologize. So the tickets go on sale September 13th. But the show is November 9th. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I was looking at the wrong dates. I was going to say, I was like, why do they keep booking these shows so quickly? And then, you know, that makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we can't really speak to exactly what Craven has done or what his style has been. Um, but all I'm saying is, I, I like, like you were saying, young boy, I hope that the, the promotion of shows in America is better. Um, I hope that they are announced in time, announced with cards. Um, you know, the well promotion to make sure these shows um, sell out or come close to selling out and have the right um, buzz and um, energy behind them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had some destruction uh, announcements for the destruction tour. Like we already mentioned, the Young Lions Cup will be taking place during the destruction tour with the finals happening at the road to, or excuse me, happening on the destruction in Kobe show. On the 22nd, we also have Blue Justice 9, which will be Nagata celebrating 35 years in wrestling. Uh, Nagata will be teaming up with Nakanishi, Kojima, Tenzan, and Liger wow. to take on the Bullet Club team of Jado, Yujiro Takahashi, Tangaloa, Tamatanga, and Bad Luck Fale. That should be pretty fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, actually, probably. <laughs> Um, and then also Naito will be defending the Intercontinental title against Jay White at the Destruction and Kobe. And more matches to be announced for that tour. I'm, I'm, my stomach is kind of feeling sick about that match. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And like we mentioned earlier, the New Japan Showdown is happening at the San Jose Civic Center on November 9th. Tickets will go on sale Friday, September 13th. Uh, international tickets for King of Pro Wrestling uh, and Rio Goku will be going on sale August 22nd. So that already passed. So those tickets are already on sale. So get those King of Pro Wrestling tickets if they're not already sold out. Then we have some uh, interesting stuff from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. First on Shibata. Um, this was from the newsletter. Dave says regarding Katsuyoro Shibata, he hasn't been cleared, but he will be attempting to get cleared. He trains with his students, but the issue in question is whether it can ever be healthy for him to take headshots. And if he were ever to return as Katsuyoro Shibata, can they work around the issue within the new Japan style? So I know that we've kind of talked about Shibata and um, Imp. We just found out that Shibata was your favorite wrestler. What do you think about um, a potential Shibata comeback, and what are your feelings on this? Well, if he's cleared, he's cleared by people who know way more than me. So, but I feel like I sh- I perfectly fine to not worry if he's been cleared. Uh, but if if he's not been cleared, then it's obviously a completely different story. And like minimal bumps, please, Katsu, <laughs> please. <laughs> Just, uh, Yes, the it's one of those um, angles that was so well done that you just you're desperate for the follow up. Um, but again, if he's not been cleared, then uh, for me it's like don't even consider it kind of thing because it's such a serious injury that happened as well. 
that it's something where you shouldn't take any risks. But then if the people who know way more than me have said, no, it's fine, then yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Do the amazing match of Shibata Kenta, please. Because <laughs> that was such an amazing heel turn. I, uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I can't imagine any doctor anywhere that would ever clear this guy after what he suffered. And I will I know it's kind of repetitive, but I'll say it again. If you've never gone and looked at what a subdural hematoma um, surgery entails and how that can affect the rest of your life, just go look on YouTube. Um, it's not something that, again, I'm kind of the same way with you. Imp. There's people who know more than me, but there's also general knowledge and general information. And this general information is out there. And I don't think he, this guy can ever take a bump. I'm surprised they let him get as physical as they did uh, at the G1 finals, um, which was amazing. And I loved that moment and I loved it all. And I would l- love nothing more than to see Shibata wrestle again. But I, I would strongly bet that he's never wrestling again. And if he does, it's not a danger of like, oh, he could get really hurt. He could die. <laughs> and it is, and that's not an and that's not like in in one of those ways where it's like, well, it's possible, but you, you know, cuz they could always die in wrestling. You just never know. I mean, it's a what they do is very dangerous. But it's the likelihood he could do like he could take one bump and he could die. Literally. So I don't think he's ever getting cleared. I really, really, really don't. Yeah, I, I would say that the chances are very slim. And he, even if he is cleared, I don't. I still wouldn't want to watch him wrestle. You, you know what what style he's used to. If, if he's wrestling, people want to see that the the hard hitting head butt, hard striking Shibata. Even if he's cleared, like can he work a non strong style match and you know come out unscathed? It's it's a very you know tough situation but like you said imp there are people who know more than us and if somehow he gets cleared then i would think they would know what they're saying but at the same time like it could be very bad and be a bad look on new japan and a bad look in pro wrestling in general if this guy gets cleared and then he gets re-injured and possibly dies or you know has a even worse you know an injury that you know paralyzes him for the rest of his life um, it'll be a bad look on the wrestling world. Um, so to pick things up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, some more stuff from the Wrestling Observer newsletter, kind of talking about uh, Kenny Omega and uh, Jay White in the booking scenarios there. So uh, Dave says in the Wrestling Observer newsletter, uh, some of this is known and some also not hard to figure out, but Gato's original booking of 2019 was for Kenny Omega to beat Hiroshi Tanahashi and keep the IWGP title at the Tokyo Dome and then defend it against Kazuchika Okada in Madison Square Garden. Omega would then be the one to lose to Kota Ibushi in the G1 Finals in the spot Jay Watt had. Whether that would have meant Okada versus Ibushi or Omega versus Ibushi at the Tokyo Dome or both, I don't know. So I really question whether that's true or not. That's what I'm going to ask. What, yeah. do you, what do you guys think about that? Um, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I just really question whether that's true or not. Um, I don't see any reason to believe that it's the case. Um, it, I mean, it, it could be. It could be. But, I mean, it was really easy for me to see going up to April that that was the trajectory that Kenny probably would have had easy. Okay, perfect. But after that, I think all bets are off. And um, there's no reason for me to think that that's what they were going to do, especially, like... You know, was Kenny going to be a heel? Was he going to get this heat on him the way Jay did? Like, I just don't know about that. That's that's a little bit more conjecture for me than anything else. Were you going to say him? Well, yeah, I was just uh, agreeing with Josh pretty much that it, it kind of it links to the rumors that was at the start of the year that Jay White would be getting all of Kenny Omega's bookings uh, to kind of like justify what happened at New Beginning when he won the championship, uh, but like that's kind of when it started circulating, circulating and. Uh, I don't, yeah, this ties to that, but I've not really seen anything to legitimize it at all. Uh, this is definitely true. Yeah, but uh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. also skeptical. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm also skeptical about this. I mean, I think Gato is pretty, um, you know, tight lipped when it comes to his booking, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to discredit Dave at all. I'm just not sure 
who he would have talked to that would have known Gato's plans for the whole year. And especially with Kenny leaving and everything, the, the way G1 was laid out, I don't know. But, you know, I don't, I don't know who he's talking to. I don't have those close socials. So I just thought it was very interesting. Um, in other news, the current IWGP U.S. heavyweight champion, John Moxley, has um, is suffering from a MRSA infection, and he's going to be missing all out. Um, we did have a question from uh, Maserati asking, it says, um, Moxley's injuries, what does this mean for the U.S. title? Uh, I literally don't know, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't have too much to speculate on it. Uh, it could mean that they lift it from him. But more than likely, when's um when's the TV coming back? What the AEW? Yeah, in October, October second. Okay, um, there is the possibility he could come back for King of Pro Wrestling if he's ready by that point. It might not mean anything. Right, so he's going to have surgery. He's going to be out for four weeks. Should be ready for the first TV of AEW. I'm not sure when this uh, Juice Mox rematch was planned. I don't know if it was going to be be at Destruction or if they were saving it for King of Pro Wrestling. I mean, I guess they're kind of forced now to do it at King of Pro Wrestling. But, yeah, I don't know. What were you thinking, Imp? Yeah, I feel like uh, the impact will be next to nothing because the amount of time that he's going to be out. Uh, yeah, if it was meant for destruction, it'd probably be pushed for King of Pro Wrestling. I uh, kind of agree with that as well. If not that, even the Tokyo Dome, because we know he's, we know Moxley's going to be free for some New Japan stuff, but I'm, I'm not sure we know how much. Like, definitely Wrestle Kingdom. Like, I think his contract runs until Wrestle Kingdom. So he either, like, he could just drop the title there, but it'd be weird for him to have no defenses, but it depends how free he is with AEW. Uh, can he actually appear at King of Pro Wrestling would be my like, immediate question. Again, we don't know anything about his contract. Right, yeah. But you know, you know, you know, New Japan doesn't put like a big like, there's like no rule on a title has to be defended in X amount of days so. Well they, you know what, they used to they used to, they yeah. used to be very vigilant about that and at, at sometimes they've chosen to be that way. For other times, especially over the last couple of years, they haven't. Uh, just look at Jericho. So, and I think Moxley is a big enough star to where like they wouldn't have wanted to have put the title on him and then not pay it off with some sort of loss to somebody. So, I don't think they're going to strip him. To be honest with you, especially since, it, like him said, it's probably not long enough. But uh, yeah, I mean they've they've been all over the place with that rule lately. Yeah. Also, we have Kane Velasquez in talks with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Kane Velasquez attended the uh, last night of the Super J Cup in San Francisco and had an informal meeting with uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling officials, according to ESPN's Mark Ramondi. And we had a, a question from Reddit user Eater of Bread. What are our thoughts on New Japan Pro Wrestling potentially bringing in Kane Velasquez? Let me ask you guys, have you, um, did you guys get to see his uh, debut at Triple A? I saw some clips. I did not see the whole match. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Did you get to see that, uh, Imp? I saw somebody on Twitter, and I'm like, I have no idea who this man is. <laughs> <laughs> He's nothing to me. <laughs> yeah, so I, I didn't get to see it from from all the reports, and I, I want to check it out. It's just been a busy few weeks. Um, everyone has said that his you know, pro debut was just really great for a first-time wrestler. But, um, you know, I don't know if he's ready for New Japan or not, but I would I would welcome it. Um, you know, I'm a fan of Inokiism, so. <laughs> 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 but, um, no, Cain Velasquez is an inc- one of the, like, greatest heavyweight fighters in the history of not just MMA, but, like, humanity. <laughs> like, he, he's a badass. So, um, you know, and if he picks up wrestling fairly quickly, like, yeah, he could be an asset. And, I mean, that might be really cool. Um, I I don't know what kind of business he can bring or anything like that, but I, I'm, I'm more for it than against it. Yeah, I would be down, um, especially if he's going to, you know, do the traditional route and kind of get in the dojo and kind of get that foundation and get trained. Um, I would be all up for it. I know you're not really familiar with Kane, so I guess you're kind of iffy on it. I mean, if he's the guardian of humanity, then yeah. (laughs) 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 Uh, 
Uh, and then in other uh, non-New Japan news, but Japan news, uh, Kenny Omega, the former IWGP champion, will be returning to Japan, but he'll be returning for DDT for the Ultimate Party 2019. Kenny will be teaming with Riho in a tag match against uh, Antonio Honda and Miyu Yamashita at Ultimate Party 2019. This is taking place in Sumo Hall, Tokyo, Japan on Sunday, November 3rd. And now it's time for the recommended match of the week. And Imp, you have the honor of giving the recommended match of the week. And both Josh and I have no idea which match you're going to recommend to our listeners. Uh, you asked if you wanted me to put it, put it in the run sheet. I said, no, surprise us. Leave it be a mystery. So lay it on us. What is your recommended match of the week? Well, I'm really proud of myself because I accidentally mentioned it in great detail early in the show. <laughs> and I did not mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I checked into uh, Ref Pro's show, uh, Epic Encounters, from last year to specifically watch Osprey versus Fantasmo. However, it was the main event that drew, that really got my attention. And that is my recommended match of the week of New Japan's Toma Ishii versus NXT's Keith Lee, Big Lad versus Big Lad. Uh, big lads kicking out of other big lads' moves because they're big and strong. It's like it's everything you want from an ECE match against another big lad. Uh, yeah, really, really, really good match. And it's one of those where it's a perfect example of showing how over ECE is to the British crowd as well, and how over Keith Lee was before he went to NXT and got a not as good theme. I love these indie themes. Yes, his, <laughs> his indie, team, indie theme was great, and I've seen both of the Ishii Keith Leaf matches. They're both up on NJPW World, and just awesome, incredible matches uh, from Ishii and Keith Lee. Yeah, we'll uh, say, uh, I love that series. Um, you know, last year we started um, doing the excursion match of the year as part of our annual year end awards, and I think part of the reason I was inspired to do that was because the year prior to that. That incredible epic encounter uh, match between Ishii and um, Keith Lee, like most likely would have probably won the year prior had we still had that category. And that's kind of what inspired me to, to make sure we had that, you know, in the awards going forward. So, um, yeah, if you've never seen that match, it's such an incredible story. It's really it, it's great pro wrestling. All right. Um, Imp, we want to thank you so much for coming on. And uh, previewing Raw Quest and doing the show with us this week. Tell our lovely listeners where uh, they can find you online. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at the damn Implicat. That's damn as in damn. <laughs> oh, I've not done that joke in ages. <laughs> uh, and I am uh, I write columns for Laws of Pain. I've started a new series where I watch Monday Night Raw and actually write a column about it. And I'm very blunt about the fact that uh, going in, I've not watched Raw for months. So it's, uh, I'm going in as somebody not invested in anything. So the stuff like the Roman Reigns injury, like, have you been injured at work? <laughs> a kind of a quality of thing. Like, oh, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> if you've not seen the Roman Reigns, I'm assuming most people listening to this do also watch WWE, but my God, the production of those things is interesting. <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but yeah, so I catch me hopefully posting a column tomorrow on Monday Night Raw, which is on right now, <laughs> as we're speaking. Um, also, I do a podcast every single week on LOP Radio, uh, talking the like, past week of wrestling. Uh, this week, I'll be previewing August 31st. And also on August 31st, I'll be live with LOP Radio Aftershock for AEW All Out. Uh, so if you want to listen to a really tired Englishman talk about it instead of some not as tired, but maybe drunk American. I don't know uh, what your pies are like. <laughs> yeah, it should, should be a, a fun uh, weekend for you. Mm. I'm not going to see Sunday. I'm just going <laughs> to crash. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Well, that's going to wrap things up here for us this week. Uh, next week, we'll be back with a Royal Quest review and Road to Destruction preview. Make sure you connect with us on social media. On Twitter, I'm at Jeremy L. Donovan. The show is at KI Strong Style. You can also follow us at Social Suplex. On Facebook, we are Facebook.com slash Social Suplex. Also, you can join us in the Wrestling Squared Circle Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash Wrestling Squared Circle. On Reddit, I am the pro black guy. Josh is keeping a strong style. You can email me, jeremy at socialsuplex.com. Also, there's going to be a Pro Wrestling Tees Labor Day sale 
Again, look out for that promo code. Go to prosolingtees.com slash social suplex. Pick you up some social suplex merchandise and support your favorite podcasters. Also, check out all the other shows on the Social Suplex Podcast Network. We have the One Nation Radio Show hosted by Rich Latta and James Boyd on Sundays. On Wednesdays, we have the Ricky and Clive Wrestling Show. Our podcast dedicated to independent wrestling, Bro Men Watch This Shit, hosted by Jeremy Tate and Chris Bryan. On Fridays, we have Get in the Ring with Danny and Mike. And on Saturdays, we have All Things Elite with Floyd Johnson Jr., Amy O., and Tiffany. So don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and review, and we will catch you next week on Keeping It Strong Style, the ace of podcasts. Thank you for listening to Keeping It Strong Style. We'll see you next time. See you next time. See you next time.